Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2023 Rivers Trust Annual Conference, all about an integrated future for water management. For anyone who doesn't know me, I am Rebecca Duncan, I'm the PR and Events Coordinator at the Rivers Trust um, and I will be kind of guiding us through proceedings here, uh, but first of all for the introduction to today's event I'm going to welcome uh, for her first Rivers Trust Conference as a member of the team Tessa Wardley. Thanks Morning. Tessa. <laughs> Thanks Rebecca. Hi, um, as Rebecca said this is my first Rivers Trust annual conference, very exciting day for me. Um, I joined the Rivers Trust just a couple of months ago um, and really enjoying everything that's going on at the moment. Um, as Rebecca said, um, our theme this year is all about an integrated future for water. Um, throughout the Rivers Trust movement, collaboration is at the core of our philosophy. Um, I'm just going to share some slides with you. Hopefully. So some of you may have heard um, something about the wisdom of crowds. This is a theory that says that a diverse collection of independent individuals make certain types of decisions and predictions better than a single member of the group. Now, I think here today, we probably have a fairly good collection of individuals united by, by rivers, but from all corners of the sector. Oh, sorry, I seem to be looking through my slides there. So lots of people here today from all corners of the sector. So I just want to test that theory with you. So I'm gonna set you a question. We're gonna kick off with a bit of a short pub quiz. So this is a, specifically a pub quiz for River Nerds. Um, and like all good pub quizzes, there are some rules. So you're not allowed to resort to Google research or any River Thrust websites when you're coming up with your answers. Um, so I would like you to come up with your best answer, best estimate to the nearest kilometer, the length of the River Thames from source to sea. So that's from Thames Head to where, where the estuary reached the sea at South End. I'm only gonna give you 30 seconds to come up with um, your best guess, and I'd like you to post it in the chat. So if you could start doing that. And then what we're going to do is I'm gonna ask my, my colleagues to have a look at the answers and we'll come back to that in a few minutes. So this is a quick, quick answer, quickly think about it and have a go and see what you can come up with. So while we finish off with that, um, I just want to talk a bit about the position we find ourselves in. So we seem to find ourselves in a unique moment where the state of our rivers is one of the most prominent environmental topics of the day. It finds itself right at the center of the media and political agenda as we come up to local elections. Just yesterday, in fact today, um, Labour have submitted a motion um, in Parliament putting forward their me private members water sewage bill. Um, and just yesterday, in the House of Lords, Baroness Bakewell asked a question about Ofwat's linking of water company dividend payment to environmental performance. And tomorrow, there's a debate about plastics in the water environment. Everything is very, very high profile. Already in 2023, we have had several announcements promising improvements to river health. But the key to actually delivering on these promises is working together and taking a joined up approach to water, water management by all stakeholders across the whole landscape. Over the next two days, we've got a fantastic agenda. And today we're kicking off um, with a number of topics that will hopefully start to whet your appetite about our future in integrated water management. It's a reasonably lighthearted but important formative collection of events. Um, and we've got some really inspirational and varied speakers. 
um, both today and tomorrow, representing a wide range of organisations that we work with, from landowners to policymakers, regulators to river users, local government, businesses, academics and other NGOs. I'm really looking forward to some great discussions. The Rivers Trust movement has a fascinating history. It's de developed and continues to develop rapidly, representing Rivers Trust and chairing a lot of sessions. We have all sorts of members from the Trust, including our founder member, Arlen Rickard. So I'm just going to turn to our number crunches and see if we have got some answers coming in from the chat. I can get my... Well, I don't think we've quite got any numbers in yet. So I'll, I'll keep telling you about our day. So we've got lots of individuals throughout the day from a number of background. And our very first session, which I'll be passing to you on quite shortly, is um, being chaired by Arlen Rickard. Rickard. He's the founder of the Rivers Trust, an OBE. And um, he has a wealth of knowledge and information and history around the Rivers Trust. So he'll be fascinating to hear talking to a number of other stakeholders. Um, I'm also going to be chairing a couple of sessions. Um, and I come right at the other end of the scale. So I've only recently joined the Rivers Trust. Um, but, you know, I come as a new enthusiastic member to the movement. Um, and I was attracted to the Rivers Trust by the fantastic can-do collaborative solutions-based approach to protecting and enhancing our rivers. We also have everyone in between um, representing our rivers. So... Number crunches have come in with an answer. So how long is the Rivers Thames? Well, the answers, you might be expecting me to come up with a winner, but what we have in the answers is a huge range. So the range came between 200 and 500 kilometers long. So that's a big range, but the answer came in at just around 300 kilometers. Now the actual, the actual distance is 250 kilometers, sorry, 346 kilometers. And the answer came in at 310 kilometers. So that's really quite accurate. That's within a 10% error. And this is kind of indicative of the point we're trying to make. The best outcomes appear when we work together. And this is embedded in the philosophy of the Rivers Trust movement. We bring people together, we work in partnership, we find the best solutions we can to make tangible improvements in our river, river catchments. So this is kind of encapsulated by this quote by Kevin Kelly, who is the founder of Wired Magazine and Conservation and a Conservationist. Nobody is as smart as everybody. And I think that's something that it's worth remembering as we go about our work. I want you throughout the, the programme today to think about taking part, oh, sorry, I seem to be flicking through the slides, Co cooperating and collaborating. I'd like you to contribute to chats, make your voice heard, recognize that your answers might not always be the right answers, but combined with other people in the room, we can come up with the right answer. By listening to all the voices, we'll come up with the right answers in the end. And I think that's a really strong advocate for the work that we do in the Rivers Trust and the work that all of you do in your organizations and us all working together. I'd now like to kick off the first event of the day. Um, hopefully Arlen and others are ready. Um, so this first session will be about water-related measures in environmental land management. And as I mentioned, um, Arlen Ricard will be chairing the event, talking to members from DEFRA, um, RSPB, and Bristol University. So I'll hand over to, to Arlen. Thank you very much indeed, um, Tessa. That's, that, that's a great start. I, I remember this little bit of science, trying to guess how many sort of jelly, jelly beans in one of those large jars. And if you source a big enough crowd, the accuracy is astonishing. So um, that's an you know, interesting little experiment. 
Um, well, I'm delighted to be chairing this session uh, of the Rivers Trust's uh, annual uh, conference. Um, as you've heard from Tessa, I was uh, uh, many years ago former CEO of, uh, of the Rivers Trust and began West Country Rivers Trust uh, itself, uh, the very first one down here in the southwest about nearly 30 years ago. In fact, we'll be celebrating 30 years next year and 20 years of the Rivers Trust. Um, I also had the pleasure of chairing the Catch and Based Approach National Support Group for, for many years. Um, anyway, I'm thrilled to be able to uh, introduce you to our panellists for our first session. Um, so we have Rob Arden and um, Akela Maggi uh, uh, from the DEFRA ELM team. Um, they're covering Sustainable Farming Incentive, the SFI, which you'll have heard a lot about, and particularly the landscape recovery uh, aspect of that. Um, uh, Nick uh, Perry Paloff, um, the RSPB's head of water policy. And um, they had some great publicity last night for some fantastic re, re meandering, re wiggling work, um, which you know is great news to get that on the uh, national news. Uh, we had our drought situation ongoing in the Southwest on the national news for our part. So not quite such an achievement. Um, and um, Penny Johns, um, uh, who I've had the opportunity to work with over the years, Professor Penny Johns, uh, and I still, well, literally, I think for 25 years we've used her soil loss equation for a lot of our calculations on farm. So um, anyway, first I'd like to uh, ask each of them to introduce themselves and just to say um, a word or two about uh, the work that they're doing and um, this particular se session of the uh, conference, which is water related measures for environmental land management. And obviously we have this kind of overall title around uh, integrated future for water management. So I think the integration is a particular area that um, Rivers Trusts are, are very interested in. So perhaps I could start um, with, uh, with Rob and uh, Ali. Um, good morning to you both. And uh, Rob, I'll, I'll start with you and then Ali, you can pick up. Um, and then, if I may, I'll, I'll move to Penny and then to Nick. Thank you, Arvin, and, uh, and good morning, everyone. So, yes, I'm, my name's Rob Arden. Uh, I work within DEFRA's Farming and Countryside Programme. So I'm a member of the team that's responsible for designing the technical content for uh, the Sustainable Farming Incentive and also for Countryside Stewardship. I'm the lead for the new water related options, which are being made available in countryside stewardship in 2024, uh, which were listed in the prospectus we published in January. So the scope of my work covers river restoration. Um, so we're planning a significant expansion of the river restoration offer in countryside stewardship. Um, and also, um, management of agricultural land for water outcomes, you know, for, for water quality, uh, for um, flood mitigation and for water resources. And so these options that I'm leading on complement the other parts of sustainable farming incentive and also countryside stewardship that will be of benefit to the water environment. So for example, the, the SFI soil standard uh, which was launched last year, and the grassland, arable, and nutrient management standards, which are being launched this year. So that's it for me. I'll pass over to Al. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Rob. And hi, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, it's good to be here on this call today. So um, along with Rob, I work in the, the farming and countryside program within DEFRA. And so Rob has already spoken about the sustainable farming incentive and, uh, and countryside stewardship offers that are being developed. And then there's a third one. So there's landscape recovery. So I sit within the team that kind of looks at the landscape recovery scheme, um, the round one pilots, which are kind of ongoing at the moment and round two opening in the, in the spring of this year. We're looking at how we design that scheme for those long term, large scale land use change initiatives that kind of projects and collaborative groups can can bring together. Um, it's much less prescriptive. And then the other two offers that we've got, that's much more about projects coming together and proposing what they would like to do over the long term. So, you know, we've got a lot of river restoration projects in this first round, and it's brilliant to see them developing. You know, I've been up to see Lee Schofield, who was in the news the other day, Arlen, um, and I've been to that site. So it was quite nice to see that in the news and talk to him about kind of what they're thinking. 
Um, I'm leading at the moment on uh, kind of how we structure the discussion with projects so that we can get to that long term implementation agreement. Um, so that's kind of one area I'm working on. And then the other area I work on is on uh, private markets and blended finance. So looking at how we crowd in kind of payments from the private sector to support these sorts of uh, different interventions around, you know, a lot of them around water quality, natural flood management, other things like biodiversity and carbon as well. So I work at Cross Deferin and trying to pull together how we do that through uh, the sort of public funds and how we can align the two to work together. So that we can all do more rather than kind of each working in our own little silos. So I'll stop there and I'll pass over to, yeah, I think it's Penny. Yeah, that's great, Al. Thank you very much. Um, Penny, over to you. Hi, everyone. I think I probably know a fair few people in the room today. Um, I'm Penny Johns. I'm from the University of Bristol and I have a very strange title of a professor of biogeochemistry. But what it really means is I've been working on what causes nutrient pollution, where it comes from, what it constitutes, what it's made up of, and then how that impacts on the biota in fresh waters for about 30 years. And that's why I say I've probably come across a fair few of you on my trips, because many times the Rivers Trust have been project partners on the various research programmes they do. So I think unlike everyone else in the room, I'm not a practitioner. I'm not out there actually trying to deliver the measures or within catchments or deliver the policy and the, the, the structure behind that. I'm doing the science. And so at the moment, my big focus is actually on livestock farming in particular, um, and organic matter more generally within rivers. It's the big unknown. We, we've had spent an awful lot of time worrying about phosphate and nitrate. And actually, it turns out those are not the main things that are driving ecosystem damage. In fact, most of the biota, the primary producers, the microbes, they prefer the organic compounds because they get their energy and nutrient resource all in one go. And we know relatively little about that. What we do know is that there are tens of thousands of compounds in your average river system. Um, that we don't, we can't even name at the moment. Um, and so the project I've just started is funded by the Natural Environment Research Council, um, and that's called Quantum. So you'll be hearing more about that, and I'm hoping that the various rivers trusts will be engaging with that as we go through. So it's a two million pound program, and in that we're going to be looking at the nutrient enrichment and the ecotoxicological and the pathogenic impacts of livestock excreta that arrive in watercourses. And I guess in the long term, what that will mean is. In terms of practitioners, we'll be looking at the DEFRA teams to be developing measures to control how farmers manage manures, ex various excreta within their farming systems. And in terms of rivers trust, you'll be looking at trying to develop and apply measures which will prevent those excreta arriving in the watercourse in the first place. Um, the other thing I suppose I ought to say is I chaired the DEFRA water expert advisory group that set the targets we didn't set them we advised on the targets defra set them um it's like one of those the separations between civil service and mps isn't it so we provided the advice and so i chaired that expert group and i also sat on the biodiversity targets expert group as well so that's just to give you a little bit of context to, to where i'm coming from so over to nick i think thanks penny yes nick over to you Fab, yeah, but thanks so much, and um, lovely to meet everyone. So I'm, I'm Nick Parapolov. Um, I'm RSPB C Senior Policy Advisor working uh, on water. I should say most of my role looks at the, the non-ag stuff, but clearly agriculture is so important to, um, to, to water management that, that it's important to have some, some overview of, um, of, of what's happening in this space as well. So, so with that hat on, I thought I'd kick off just with some very initial observations of um, kind of where we are with, with ELMS in, in, in our kind of wider work programme. So... Um, RSPB are obviously strong supporters of, of the principle of um, of ELMS. Um, as we're moving into kind of the more detailed delivery, we're in this kind of a bit of an odd interregnum at the moment, are we, aren't we, where we have some detail, but maybe not the full suite to really understand kind of what the uh, um, what the impact on, on the water environment will be. So I think my comments today are sort of understood within within that lens that um, we're, we're broadly supportive and we're keen to work through um, the detail to really understand kind of how we can we can target actions under elms towards uh water improvement because it will be a key uh key policy lever in terms of um restoring the health of, of our waterways um i suppose just two quick observations if i could um just on, on current state of play i think um in terms of the schemes themselves and particularly with respect to sfi as as um as rob mentioned we have seen some water watery stuff coming through um which is positive so the soil management and now the nutrient management and the pesticides bit of the uh, pest management um, standards um, will be relevant to water management. I, I think it's fair to say that they're 
fairly limited in scope and, and there are more coming forward in 2024 I understand on um on buffers for water courses and stuff so interested to kind of carry on the discussion as as more details uh, are made available um I think specific um kind of areas it might be interesting to consider for for growth would be more on water resources so there seems to be a lot of bias on um water quality um but resources is going to need to be an important part of the conversation I think going forward um Likewise, I think when we come to uplands and the uplands offer at the moment on moorlands um, is, is the only one I think that I've spotted in in the SFI at least. Um, and, and again, that stand at the moment is kind of at the introductory level. So there's not much on, on specific actions there. So hard to know exactly what, what improvements we'll see um, coming through there. And, and then of course, there's, of course, the perennial issue of um, is there enough money to actually to drive these options? And how do we get from from the menu of options to the environmental outcomes that that we're looking to see? Um, so. Yeah, that's on, on the schemes themselves. Just quickly, I thought I could add just um, where ELM sits within the wider policy framework. And this is kind of more my, my day to day. I look a lot more at what's happening in respect of water companies and, and nutrients and, and, and those kinds of issues. And um, here, I think there's a bit of an inconsistency emerging that would be great to, to discuss today, I think, because um, particularly when we're talking about the landscape recovery schemes, which which I agree, I think one of the most um, interesting and, and exciting kind of arms that, that we have Um does seem to me that nutrient neutrality, for instance, is a great, um, it's exactly the kind of scheme that landscape recovery should be looking to 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 to, uh, to benefit from. However, then we see the LERB amendment coming in and, and actually eating up a lot of that nutrient reduction with kind of blunt tool of um, infrastructure upgrades. And so I think that seems to me, a, a, you know, um, a bit of a confused policy space that would be interesting to, to, to go through a bit more today. And I think the, the question to government is whether they'd like to see nutrient management coming through new money on people's water bills or committed budget actually through through the ag um, uh, the ag support regimes that it's introducing and, and and clearly the way I framed it suggests that my my sympathies are with the latter. Um, so yeah, two high level observations just just to get us going. And but really looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Now, that's really helpful, Nick. Thanks. <clears throat> um, I'll I'll come back to Rob and um, Al in just a sec. See if you'd like to respond to to those those um, challenges. That you've set. Um, just sort of looking at, at, at the formats, we have until 11, um, and uh, we're going to just kind of knock these ideas around between us a little bit um, for the first session. And then um, for the last um, 15 minutes, um, we'll be looking to address um, questions from our, from our audience, um, which I had asked them please to submit through the Q&A function uh, rather than the chat function. So if you have um, questions you'd like to put to the panel uh, or some some key points, uh, please submit them to the Q&A and then we'll start picking those up um, during that last um, 15 minutes. Um, there are some in interesting questions already on there uh, and one or two I know in, in the chat. Um, so so uh, Rob and Al, um, would you like to just come back to, to Nick on, on these sort of uh, uh, issues around um, development of these themes around water and the sort of integration of some of these programs. Rob, do you want to take the SFI kind of water quality yeah. water resources? Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of uh, kick off on that. Um, so, so yes, thanks, thanks, Nick. So, um, at the moment, you know, we launched SFI last year. Um, uh, with a, a sort of limited offer sort of focused on on soils uh because, because, uh, sort of good soil, soil management is the basis of so so uh, many of our, our environmental uh outcomes uh sort of including outcomes for water um we've got had um just over three thousand applications um there's a sort of significant expansion um this year, including you know some uh, some new standards which are um, sort of highly relevant to water. So not just the integrated pest management and the nutrient management, but also um, uh, uh, the arable and improved grassland and low input sort of grassland standards. Um, so we're we're expected there's there's a lot more basically coming uh, into SFI sort of. Uh, this year, the the way we're um, the way we're thinking about it though is we we have the SFI offer, but we also have the the countryside stewardship offer, which countryside stewardship is our sort of primary um, agri environment scheme. We've we've got 
sort of over 30,000 sort of farmers in it at the moment. It's really in the countryside stewardship space that um, that's where I'm sort of personally working and where we're, you know, looking to sort of significantly expand our uh, water offer, you know, obviously including um, uh, river restoration. There's, there's a pretty, you know, the, there's a fairly limited river restoration offer in countryside stewardship at the moment. We have an, uh, an option called making space uh, for water. Um, we're doing work to increase the accessibility of that option. Uh, that option is about incentivizing sort of active river channel uh, movement. But we're also introducing sort of new options for the management of riparian habitat and also for connecting river and floodplain habitats. And we're also sort of looking at um, uh, where countryside stewardship can be, uh, the scope can be widened for uh, both water quality. We've obviously got buffer options within countryside stewardship at the moment and uh, coming into the sustainable farming incentive. Uh, we're looking to introduce a new option called 3D buffers, which is specifically targeted at, at water quality, but obviously would have benefits for uh, flood mitigation and water resources as well. And just sort of picking up on Nick's point about sort of water resources, we, we're designing two new options with a, a bit of a focus on water resources and flood mitigation, one for a grassland situation and one for an arable situation to hold more water sort of back in, in the catchment and sort of recharge um, aquifers. Um, so I think as a totality, let's not think about sort of SFI and countryside stewardship in sort of isolation uh, to each other. You know, a farmer can, can be in both. Obviously, they can't be paid to do the same thing um, uh, in, 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 uh, in sort of both schemes, but they are designed to work together. And then obviously we have landscape recovery um, sort of on, on top of that, which hopefully it's a good segue to to our it's a very smooth segue yeah. um yeah so nick i think your point's really interesting so the landscape recovery schemes like the projects at the moment that are in train have been given these pots of project development funding so they have you know kind of up to two years to look at what is available to them in terms of what actions they would like to take costing those actions and then what the, what kind of markets there are that they can access to kind of bring in some private money so for example you were saying nutrient neutrality the potential for nutrient neutrality to kind of put some money towards these projects for us it's still a question in terms of the scale of that and also the geographic disparity so we know that some of these markets might not be prevalent across the country in a uniform way there might be kind of specific areas where nutrient neutrality payments from water companies or other areas developers might make sense but then there's other areas where actually that demand isn't there and so it might have to come from public support so I think when you were saying kind of you were talking about should it come via kind of bills and payments from water companies or others or ag agricultural support system um I don't think it's necessarily one or the other it could be a mix depending on the geography of the projects and kind of where they're looking at and what work they're doing within the catchments and for us, that's kind of still something we're trying to look at at the moment. We're trying to um, we're trying to understand kind of how the projects look at that and how they're able to secure some of that money. Um, and that's similar to some kind of biodiversity net gain is in a similar state. You know, the market rules came out, I think, maybe a month ago. And so we're trying to understand again, you know, what's the balance between developers providing biodiversity net gain payments versus where maybe those markets aren't aren't so prevalent but we still want to drive uh biodiversity improvements or you know nutrient improvements in the case of nutrient neutrality um but that's kind of what the landscape recovery development phase is all about it's all about us trying to understand a bit more about how these things work together how we can get that large scale land use change and kind of drive those environmental improvements alongside food production in some of these large areas um, thanks al i mean i yeah. think one of the General concerns, if you like, particularly from the Rivers Trust perspective, is that 
we, we, we feel that we've lost ground over the last perhaps 20 years, um, and we've got a huge amount to make up. Um, and there's a range of reasons for that. But, but coming right back to the sort of theme of this morning's um, discussion, which is around regulation and enforcement, and I appreciate these initiatives we're talking about now are primarily voluntary initiatives. But um, we have, you know, we have the basic SAFA regulations, which we know are, are, are um, many farms don't uh, meet in terms of compliance. Um, we have our NVZs, which don't cover the whole country, we, but we opted for um, regions. Um, that's created problems and, and it's always been open to challenge by farmers. We have the farming rules for water. Um, uh, many of these, many farmers have quite a low awareness of that. Many of these programs really have, because of um, lack of enforcement, lack of political will, uh, and I, I, I will say that, I, I know you can't, but, but we have seen certain ministers that haven't been so hot on the regulation and enforcement side. And of course, there's been huge cuts in your regulator, um, DEFRA itself, you know, losing uh, around half its funding environment agency and so on over a period. Some of that being reinstated, which we're very welcome to see. But, but we are sort of in this very difficult position. And many farmers uh, range hugely from, from those who are sometimes through lack of awareness, you know, not, not so deliberate, uh, serial polluters, uh, and those who are right at the other end of the scale doing amazing work um, you know, rewilding and, and, and using new approaches. So, so it's very, very, it's very difficult. Um, I mean, I went to um, agricult agricultural college in the 70s, um, and we had our, back in those days, the MAF approved book of pesticides. Um, uh, and I was sent out, you know, the knapsack, and I was actually spraying Agent Orange, you know, I was spraying 245T. Almost every single product that was in that book is now banned. Um, paraquat, atrazine, you, know, you, you name it, it's all there. Um, and, and yet, even today, I'm quite sure in 20 years' time, most of the pesticides we're using today will be equally alarmed. So, so this is a this is moving ground. I mean, Penny exemplifies this very much in our lack of understanding about nutrients. Now these things join up. I mean, I've always felt we need a holy trinity of water, soil, and air. They are so connected. 25% of the pollutants affecting London air quality are coming from farming. I mean, most people in London would be amazed at that, and so would most farmers. So we need to be addressing ammonia, we need to be addressing NO2. I mean, are we really, in, you know, are we really making that step change? I mean, perhaps I could bring Penny into the comment, but, you know, we've got so much to do. We need to integrate, we just need every power we have. We need to get the water companies not delivering on their bit just, but really contributing to catchment management in a proper way. So this stacking and layering of funding and building on that needs to be as easy, understandable and accessible as possible to farmers, yet having that regulatory baseline absolutely clear in everyone's mind and the common thread coming from ministers right down to um, the enforcers on the ground. Penny. Yeah, so I think um, just to contextualise where we are at the moment, um, it's really... I. I, I will usually work with the water quality teams in DEFRA, so I'm not so familiar with, with Rob and, and Al. Um, and it's really interesting and fascinating to hear all of the measures that they're trying to develop. <clears throat> but we shouldn't forget the scale of ambition that's been agreed and is now in law. So a 40% reduction in, um, in, 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 in phosphorus nitrogen from farming, 80% um, reduction from sewage works. We're not going to get there with the sorts of measures that we have in place at the moment. What we'll do is we'll make it slightly better. And we will carry on picking up those types of farmers. There was one in the news recently who scoured out a huge section of riverbank and destroyed the, the river and dug up a whole load of gravel. And I thought, well, that's really, you know, that, that's great to see. And we should be doing more of that. But in terms of getting to the level of ambition we're talking about, we need to go well beyond where we are at the moment. Um, so we will be talking about uh, things like taking land out of cultivation. We will be talking about buffer strips that actually are effective. If you think about the concept of a buffer, buffer strip, for example, the idea is that the, the nutrients come down the hill with the sediments and they arrive in the buffer strip, but hey presto, they just they just disappear. And of course, we all know that that's not true. They don't just disappear, they accumulate until the system is full and then they flush. And so I've done quite a lot of work in my career looking at wetland systems and how they actually function. Um, and when you go to a mature wetland system, then you'll find that they're actually just taking in the nitrate, the phosphate, and anything stuck to sediment particles, processing it, breaking it down, and then shunting it out into the river in the next storm event. So, so these are not long-term solutions. Now they have 
they have other benefits they have biodiversity benefits and so they aren't a bad thing but certainly the sort of size that we're talking about in many of the river catchments is way too small it's too narrow and one of the things we're going to be looking at for example in this new program is actually how big does the buffer strip need to be to make any difference to the nutrient chemistry in in the river and we're thinking at least 100 meters at least 100 meters you're talking about maybe taking out small fields along rivers you're talking about maybe not farming at all in those areas and of course that that applies in areas where you have um impermeable um systems so most of the water is coming through the soil or over the top where you have permeable systems those riparian buffers will do nothing because the water always takes the path of least resistance and anyone from somewhere like the wessex short stream rivers trust um, in the room today is going to tell you that, 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 that that's the case. The water will go through the gravels underneath the wetland and straight into the bed of the river and neatly bypassing that, that buffering function. So my, 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 my suggestion, um, my conclusion, is that Arlen is absolutely right. We need to be thinking bigger. We need to be thinking in a much more holistic way. Now, that, that doesn't mean what we're doing at the moment in terms of elms and sustainable farming and so on and so forth is a bad thing. It's not, because we have to get communities engaged with how do we do this? Who has rights? What are we willing to give up in order to have environmental benefit? And who pays? And I, I noticed in the chat somebody mentioned the concept of the polluter pays. And, you know, it's very, um, it, it's very easy to say, well, the farmer is the polluter all the water companies the polluter, but actually we are the polluters, all of us, because it's our consumption of resource in a profligate way without thinking about where it's come from, how it was produced or where it goes once it flushes down the toilet. You know, we're the ones who are generating this. So we need to get people on board with the idea that they may need to pay for environmental goods and services. And then we need to start developing measures where we're not simply shunting the pollutant from the water back up into the atmosphere. You know, we need a net gain for environment not a net gain for a sector of the environment. Otherwise, we just cause another pollution problem somewhere else. So it's a, a pollutant swapping issue. And, and there's a real danger in some of the measures of doing that. There's also a, a problem that we're going to be facing in terms of markets. Um, we talked about those earlier, you know. So the one I'm most familiar with is in the Wessex region. It's called Entrade, where it, Wessex Water pay farmers to deliver a nutrient reduction that they can then report, um, particularly in things like the Pool Harbour Initiative and so on. Um, and in reality, now you're asking the water companies to reduce by 80% their phosphorus loading. We did try to get nitrogen, by the way. We gave very clear advice that wastewater needs to reduce its nitrogen loading as well. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't accept our advice. So it's very clear in the documents if you want to know about it. We should be reducing the nitrogen as well. Um, so if, if Wessex Water's got to reduce its phosphorus loading by 80%, but the farmer's got to reduce this by 40 to 50%, well, then the farmer's not going to be willing to sell those nutrient credits anymore because they're going to need to deliver that on their own farm. And so we need to be bringing people together in these catchment based approaches that are so effective in so many ways. But we need people to understand the level of ambition that is needed um, and the ambition within the measures and the funding. We need all the funding. We don't need to just have government funding and, and just have tax money. We need it all if we're going to hit these targets because they're, they're seriously ambitious targets. Thank, th thank you, Penny. Um, and uh, Nick, do you want to come back in? Um, and I'd uh, invite any of you to, to just jump back in as uh, as we sort of continue this chat, if you. Uh, but, uh... Yeah, lots of great stuff in there. And, you know, I I'd, I'd, um, I'd strongly support the, the solution that, 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 that Penny's chucked out for us, which is it's that missing middle, isn't it? We, we need that catchment level implementation not just planning we actually need someone to 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 deliver at, at the catchment level as well and it kind of speaks to this um wider issue i think that we've got no shortage of targets and initiatives but the two just don't really speak to each other in any meaningful way that i can tell and it's actually very difficult to take stock of the suite of you know all the different things that you're trying to do in elms and and robbers as you've said um beyond the sfi and in cs as well but how do we take all of those and actually get to get get to the targets such that they are? And I'd add, how do we get there absent uh, an overall target for the health of the waterways, which um, at the moment we kind of stand to lose, don't we, in, in 2027? So, that, yeah, I think that's a, that, that's another kind of piece of the puzzle that I think is um, is worth bringing into the discussion. Um, just, just to um, add to uh, Arlen, your observations, I think um, one way I like to think of the interaction between regulation and, and markets um, I actually see it as potentially, I mean, sometimes the discussion, maybe not today, but in, in other four is it's one or the other. And actually it's much more interesting to consider how can the two support each other. And I think particularly when we talk about uh, talk about cross compliance, 
So again, something we're losing in the move away from basic payments into ELMS. But actually, these private schemes, I think, are an interesting new hook to say, let's see your regulatory compliance as a condition on entry into the, the market-based schemes as well. So I actually can see a world in which, um, yeah, the regulation and the markets come to complement and, and kind of mutually um, support each other. Um, and, and Penny, the point you've raised about funding, I think, is, is really the... You know, no one likes to talk about money too much, but it really is the, the be all and end all, isn't it? And um, I just check out there that, um, again, if you look at the pots of money which are available and their size is relative to what they're trying to achieve, it's difficult looking at the suite of those to say that we've got the right money in the right places for the for the right measures. And and, and just as a case in point, um, I think we've got a session coming up on, on sewage later on, which I'm which I'm really looking forward to. But that was a public policy issue which was elevated as kind of first order. And then all of a sudden, there's the best part of 60 billion quid, which has been committed, right? That's about 2 billion a year until until the problem is is solved to, to the satisfaction of the government, at least, if not everyone else. So that's 2 billion a year just for sewerage. With ELMS, we're talking about just shy of 3 billion for the whole basket of environmental goods that we're trying to achieve. And water is only a, a part of that, it's worth remembering. And then we look across other levers and we've kind of got a few pots here and there. But I think that stark contrast there really sets out um, the point that Penny made so well, which is... Are we are we putting the right uh, levels of commitment in in the right places? And 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 again, going back to I think the answer of we have these siloed uh, policy drivers, and they're all actually trying to do the same stuff. So why is it that the water companies can't do more of what they need to do through land use change, particularly where it's the cheaper and it's the quicker, often and and the more accessible interventions and and so on? And yeah, how do we get farmers trading credits, taking the totality of nutrient reduction that we need? not just their little patch of it as as assessed bottom up so um so yeah totally agree with with a lot of the sentiments expressed today uh, th th thanks thanks very much nick um well i'll just come back to to, to rob and al and then we'll go into um that that the q and a sort the session and pick up some of those which have appeared um obviously very difficult for you guys i mean i i i was on the um stakeholder group the early stakeholder group for elm and i've also joined in some of the more recent discussions around the um, new measures, the, as you say, 3D buffers, the surface and groundwater measures and the river and stream floodplains discussion. Appreciate you won't be able to say too much about that now, but you know that that development's really very welcome. Um, and everyone I've worked with, you know, has been working hard and very dedicated. Um, we all, we, we need to help you really get this delivered. And I think as Nick made the point, I mean, um, uh, you know, our our uh, only 14% of our rivers at good ecological status in England and none meeting chemical status. You know, somebody's asking about that in the chat. It is a serious position. We have a 25 year plan. No, you know, not so many years left now to deliver that. Um, uh, and the, that 3 billion that uh, Nick alluded to or right thereabouts is our best hope. So if we can deploy that in the most efficient, effective way and bring uh, that land use change that we need, those interventions that we need, you know, th th this is terribly important. But equally, you know, building on the sort of classic pyramid of regulation at the bottom and then uh, as incentives stacking up, each supporting another to, to a sort of a pinnacle where you have voluntary measures um, bringing in people uh, and really testing how far you can go in like, the pure rewilding, if you like. Anyway, um, perhaps just final comment on, on, on that, uh, Rob, Al. I appreciate landscape recovery has got opportunities to do a lot of this. So that's quite exciting. And I, and I hope you kind of keep an open mind on that. Um, but um, and, and then we'll go to the Q&A. A chance for you guys to come back on us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Arlene. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with, with a few points. Um, on, on the sort of regulation side of things, obviously myself and Al both work on, on sort of incentives, but obviously regulation is you know, uh, and enforcement of that is is a key part of the picture. Obviously, there are the farm farming rules for water, which are designed to sort of set the minim minimum requirements. Um, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Arvin, we've sort of recently increased environment agency capacity to help to enforce that, as well as alongside on the uh, the more the sort of carrot uh, side of the equation, a, an increase in catchment sensitive farming advice. So that programme now covers um, all, all catchments. Um, and we sort of recognise that there's some, you know, there's uh, some sort of real barriers from a farmer's point of view, actually, sometimes in complying with all, all of that regulation, which is, you know why, for example, we've been um, 
uh, providing some funding to help uh, people uh, to upgrade their slurry storage because we realize uh, you know that is a um, you know that is um, potentially a very sort of costly operation um, that um, uh, that um, you know a lot of businesses will struggle to sort of financially um, comply with um, then in terms of sort of incentives um so yeah um P penny i i i sort of totally agree with with your point that you know um that ideally what we want to be doing is is um from an environmental outcomes point of view is um more ambitious la land use change um uh and we're, we're sort of designing the um, scheme. So there's um, a variety of offers for creation or restoration of semi-natural habitat, which, which, will, um, which will have um, sort of beneficial outcomes for water as well as biodiversity. Um, the, the buffering um, type options that I've been working on, I think are just sort of part of the jigsaw, you know, in, in terms of the source sort of pathway receptor, I'm quite focused, I guess, on, on the pathway um, side, side of things. Obviously, we need to balance, um, you know, a, a variety of, of sort of considerations, including, obviously, we have um, a responsibility under the agriculture act for um the food duty so um one thing we need to do for all of our uh, schemes is do assessment of sort of impact on on food production as as such but um you know we're designing a, a wide offer so uh and and crucially i think an offer that we we do a lot of work um with uh, ngos such as such as the river trust but also with farmers uh, and other land managers, because we want to make sure that what we design are things that they're feasible for farmers to do, and you know it's attractive for them, them to take take them up as well. So I'll Thanks. I'll pass over to Al. Thanks, Rob. Well, I'll, I'll, let me just dive into the first question because that may give you a lead um, that I've got here. So um, from from Stephen, um, he he says uh, he's been reading about the um, issues in Wales, Natural Resources Wales and the lockdown effectively on a lot of planning permissions and um, you know, new housing needed and, uh, and, and so forth uh, because of phosphorus loading in the system. Um, I mean, would you see, how would you see dealing with this? This is also becoming an issue in England as well. Um, so this absolute necessity to drive down nitrate and phosphorus loadings um, and particularly rivers which are, you know, which are SACs um, uh, this is becoming a key problem. It's a problem in all the rivers. It's just the fact that that the SAC is the ones that have the regulation to be able to lock down that uh, development. Um, but uh, obviously, on the on the um, uh, landscape recovery, we're not going to be able to see that everywhere. So, so how, how how would you see this being picked up? So I think I mean, so I can't speak for Wales and kind of how they're doing. Defra's our remit is is very much England based, but like you say, these issues are starting to impact in England as well. Um, I mean, this comes back to kind of Penny's question, right? What's the conversation around what balance are we willing to go through for environmental benefits? You know, are we willing to stop these housing development pressures because of the nutrient of kind of phosphate loading that we're seeing they're doing in Wales and in England as well? Um, and I think we're starting to see the argument kind of move in that direction where actually, no, it is about environment is taking a, a priority at the moment. Um, in terms of how that then manifests, uh, I would say the nutrient markets, you know, we're talking about these markets, these private markets, they're not really that developed at the moment and they're still very new. And so for me, it's really about kind of trying to see what, how they develop. Um, recently, the green finance strategy was released and there was a nature market framework that was released. And there's a lot more work going on within DEFRA that will help to kind of shape these markets and kind of, uh, kind of outline what government's role is in these markets developing, which should then start to drive kind of the pathway between the nutrient reduction requirements and that investment coming in to the to the sector, to the water sector, to kind of unlock some of that development. But as you were saying, Arlen and Penny, it's not just about the the regulatory side of kind of 
balancing the development pressures. There's kind of all these other places where the development pressures don't exist that we still need to do a lot of the work uh, to improve water quality and river status. Um, and so then the, my question is, well, where does the money come from for that as well? There need to be kind of maybe other sources. And we need to, as Penny was saying, we need to tap all the different areas of money that are out there, bring them together so that actually, rather than, you know, one water company's funding working here and the development payments working there and the, the public money going here, we can actually bind together in a catchment approach and do a lot more, a lot more effectively uh, when we come together. But uh, part of the landscape recovery pilots is to kind of test how we can do that, how we bring this together, how we bring the land managers together, how we bring these organisations together so that, you know, we can A, bring the expertise together, but B, also bring the pots of money together and do a lot more together. Um, so kind of drew out a little bit, but yeah, you know, we're working well, on that one. Invite any 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 of the panelists here just to sort of dive in. Um, but picking up on those themes, uh, or, or the next question perhaps, which kind of links into that, Al. Um, and delighted to hear what you're saying on that because I, I think you know that, that idea of integration and um, uh, an integrated program um, is so so critically important and. There may be a role there for the catchment based approach and the catchment partnerships in terms of bringing together um, third sector, you know, local communities, um, civil society, business and government departments and local authorities, you know, all, all together to get that kind of joined up thinking. Um, Kelvin raises the issue about nutrient neutrality and, and that we mustn't be sort of just looking to sort of allow water companies perhaps just to trade to, to kind of get rid of some of their responsibilities. It needs to be over and above. So if they're working with farmers, um, and, and as Penny alluded to, you know, we, we need to be delivering right across the board to, to really lock down the, the and there needs to be a, a life cycle approach, you know, a circular economy approach. So phosphorus and, and nitrogen, um, nitrogen is really expensive and, and, and produce, you know, energy expensive as well. And, and phosphorus is, is finite. So, you know, we really should be managing these things better. Anyway, anyone like to dive in and, pick up on nutrient neutrality or, or polluter pays is, is another, you know, how, how far do we take that line and how can we make that work? Arlen, I, I, I offer something on that. I mean, in terms of the polluter pays principle, <clears throat> in terms of the food that we consume, for example, or the water that we just turn on the tap and hey presto it appears, we don't pay anywhere near enough for what we have. And food, although we have a cost of living crisis and there's an issue in, in, around fair and equitable adaptation um, where we need government assistance for those who can't afford. Um, we don't pay anywhere near enough for the food that we consume and we certainly don't pay the environmental damage costs associated with producing that food and I think the conversation starts with organisations like the Rivers Trust, like the ISPB, speaking to their memberships, getting people on board, local communities and so on, informing them and, and sort of educating them gently about what the challenge is and where it's coming from and what their role is in terms of those things. So, for example, with my, my first year students, I have a lecture on water and it's not it's about quantity, not quality, because we, goodness, they can't cope with quality at that stage. We hit them to that later. Um, but with, in terms of quantity, I just say to them, so we're going to finish this lecture. You're going to go down to Costa Coffee and you're going to grab a meal. You're going to have a burger, mug of coffee. You're going to have a bar of chocolate and maybe a bowl of olives because these are Bristol students after all. Um, and I, I get them to sort of estimate how many litres of water go into producing that meal. And the relative numbers are in the ones to tens of litres. And then I tell them it's actually seven and a half thousand litres went into producing that one meal. And they're absolutely shocked. Now, I think we need to shock people. I think people need to understand what the consequences are of the choices that they're making. And at the moment, that, that's a public debate that we haven't had as a nation. So I think, you know, organisations like yours are going to be key to helping to support those debates so people understand because we've seen with our switch to things like recycling of waste you know there was huge resistance when it first came in we'll just do it now you know we can go on holiday and we still do it so, so people are adaptable and and many of them are horrified by what they're seeing in terms of the state of the environment and they want to do something so we need to assist them to do what they can but part of that is going to be paying the full cost of the food that they're consuming and if we put the environmental damage costs on top of say meat production for example i saw somebody ask you know if we if we moved away from meat consumption would that help yes it would and it would help in multiple ways now i'm not suggesting we should all become vegetarians it's part of it we're, we're omnivores and it's a natural thing to do to consume meat vegetarians may differ um but you know we can certainly reduce the consumption of meat and if your meat was costing two or three or four times as much as it is at the moment 
in the supermarket. We might move back to the kind of diet we had when I was growing up, where you didn't have chicken every day. You had roast chicken on a Sunday as a treat for the family. You know, and we've just got to the situation at the moment where everyone thinks they can have it. And in the words of a very famous advert, I can have it because, because I'm worth it. <laughs> and I always think, yes, but do you, do you have a right to have it? You know, and the answer is, is you don't. So I think education around these issues is going to be absolutely key to getting engagement. And there will be resistance, which is why these approaches like the pilot studies in relation to things like sustainable farming are so important because they're starting to build those communities <clears throat> where you can have those conversations. Um, and getting over those barriers, those cultural barriers to change is going to be a key part of, of us being able to move forward. But we, we mustn't forget the scale of ambition. We also shouldn't, I think, this is something I want to come back to, over egg the, uh, the the benefits of the water framework directive so we we worry in the, in the media we have lots of conversations about oh we're going to lose these protections can i just say that in the 40 years since we've had those protections we've lost 85 83 percent of biodiversity in fresh waters <clears throat> this is not a vehicle that's actually delivered and in the names of another ad, words of another advert it needs to do what it says on the tin regulation no matter how shiny and lovely it looks and how ambitious it sounds, if it's not in, in, enforced, if it's not delivered in the way in which it was intended, it's bad legislation. It's, it's a shiny piece of dross. And we need to start again and say, well, how can we actually deliver? And that comes down to proper investment in monitoring and enforcement. And that's what we're really lacking in the UK. We don't have enough monitoring. The monitoring we have is completely unfit for purpose. Um, we can top that up with contributions from community groups, but a lot of the things that we need to measure you need to get really expert analysts involved because they're difficult to measure and to do it well. So we need to have more monitoring. We need to be monitoring the right things in the right place at the right frequency. And we need to then have a, a regulator who has teeth. And that hasn't been the case. That's been getting worse and worse. So that's the last thing I think I'll contribute there. <laughs> well, again, you know, very, very good points and, and, and key challenges that we really have to address. It was always an interesting discussion around uh, around um, eating meat because obviously we we don't eat grass but grassland is is just terribly terribly good and sort of browsing grassland even better um, in terms of locking up carbon and, and increasing organic matter um, and of course something like eighty percent of all our British wildlife depends on grassland as part of its life cycle so mm -hmm. to some extent we do away completely with meat you know we would lose. A lot of those well, I, mean, I think that's a question of how you manage it so this comes back to the DEFRA teams about how you keep the grass so how do you how do you compensate the farmers so that we we have the grassland doing all those things that it does so well but we have lower stocking densities yes. but if we can achieve that we don't just have benefits for the water we have better benefits for soil we have benefits in terms of sequestration of carbon and hitting net zero targets and all, we've also got healthier happier animals and we've got healthier people because we're eating less meat which is actually not very good for us so you know dealing with things like the obesity crisis part of that is to do with thinking about the kinds of foods that we actually consume so so when we start thinking about how we engage communities in delivering some of these more challenging changes that we need it's about explaining all of the benefits that will accrue and not just a narrow subset. And at the moment with the DEFRA teams I've worked with, for example, with the with delivering on the targets, um, then we've been doing, or they've been doing cost benefit analysis, but it's very narrowly constrained. And none of these other benefits that would accrue are actually added into the mix. And when you start adding in the other benefits, suddenly the benefits hugely outweigh the costs and it becomes something that you want to do because you're gonna hit multiple targets. So. Uh, you know that's where we should be going holistic very good well uh sadly we literally come to the end of our of our time um um i think we've tried to pick up some of the threads of the q a um we can always uh try to um answer those uh, offline um afterwards um uh is any final comments from anyone next any any sort of um, farewell comment you'd like to make um, no, just to say thank, thanks very much um, for, for inviting us along today. And yeah, really, really interesting discussion. I'm um, really great to, to take part and I'm really keen to see how, how it progresses um, as, as, as we learn more about um, uh, ELMS and, and how it's going to operate. So yeah, thank you very much.
Thank, thanks, Nick. Well, th thank you. Great, very great. Thank you for, to all, all my panelists and, and, and Rob and, and Al, particularly, um, you know, for us uh, sort of uh, challenging you. Um, we wish you every success in rolling out the um, Elms programme, the SFI landscape recovery and the integration with all the other work we're doing. And um, I, I can assure you that Rivers Trust and Catchment Partnerships um, will be there rooting for you. And if we can help in any way in spreading the message, um, getting it out to the farmers, um, bringing everyone on board, you know, we'll we'll be there for you. So, thank you all to the panelists. I know everyone watching will uh, will have appreciated your your contributions. Thank you all, and I'm going to hand back um, either to Mark directly or or to Becca. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arlen. Um, I mean, that was a really fascinating uh, discussion, and the the chat and the Q and A have been uh, have been uh, um, a, a light. So um, it's been um, a, you know really really good opening to, uh, to to the conference. So so thanks for that. Um, we're now moving on to a discussion about the um, importance of the uh, of the catchment based approach. I know we're we're hoping that um, Ali Morse is going to join us, um, uh, and I know Becca's frantically trying to contact her. Um, so, um, what I'm going to do is just make a few introductory remarks, and then I'll um, then I'll turn to my fellow panelists, which will hopefully involve Ali, um, uh, uh, to introduce themselves and and to, and to say a few words, and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, but really, the catchment-based approach is, is something really that's always been at the heart of um, uh, of the Rivers Trust. The Rivers Trust has always been founded on uh, on river catchments. Um, it's absolutely clear that um, uh, that that you know what. The, the the river is an outcome of of the catchment area that uh, that, that drains into it um and the catchment based approach is, is now 10 years old um it was um formed by by richard benyon um as an attempt to try and address the the um failure to to implement the um water framework directive um and it it's an odd name it's always struck me as an odd name because it, it sounds like a kind of philosophy rather than a thing um, but actually, it's really about people and organisations um, working working together, and it and it involves 105 catchment partnerships um, throughout England, covering the whole of England, and an immense amount of knowledge and and social capital has really been uh, built up um, over the last 10 years. Um, Arlen has always used the phrase that that the catchment based approach is about people ganging up on the problem rather than on each other. Um, and uh, and also that it's a it's a coalition of the willing, and I think you know those are really good descriptions. Um, you know everyone's welcome. Um, there are no barriers to entry, and um, and it's really about people getting together at a local scale to um, look at the problems in their catchment area and to look at how they can work together um, uh, on solutions. Um, the Rivers Trust does chair the, the national support group um, uh, um, and, um, and, and hosts about 70% or so of, of, of the partnerships um, at, at a local level. But it really is a partnership approach and, and um, the Wildlife Trust have been really kind of, um, you know, really, really key to supporting this, uh, uh, along with lots of other NGOs, but also um, uh, DEFRA and the Environment Agency. Um, and the NFU and, and WWF and lots of other organizations have, have been in, involved um, in the catchment based approach. At a national scale, we've, you know, we've developed a really um, brilliant uh, data package, which has got um, more than 200 layers, which show what's going on in, in every catchment. And we have a, a number of working groups like um, agriculture working group, um, urban governance. You're going to hear from, from Peter, who's, uh, who chairs the, um, the urban working group. And really, the partnerships are about writing um, plans at a local level and they, the catchment plans actually go into the river basin management plans and also about working together to deliver stuff at, at a local level and 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 the catchment based approach generates more than double the um, funding that it gets from from government from from non-government sources so you know it's really good value for value for money um, we don't get much money <laughs> each partnership gets you know, a maximum of fifteen thousand pounds to do a pretty complex job. Some get only seven and a half thousand pounds a year um, to do. You know, as I say, what what is really a difficult job, and and you know, a lot of that gets eaten up in hiring venues and and uh, you know, providing um, refreshments and, and biscuits for people who who, who volunteer their time. Um, I think we're at a kind of crossroads with it. Um, it feels like, I mean, the Secretary of State 
talked about the importance of a catchment based approach when she was launching the the plan for water lately um, um, you know just recently um and um you know so it feel you know that that feels very positive and we've been asked to submit a business case to to defra um for more funding um so we're um busily uh, working away um on on that um, and also trying to make the case for more funding for our catchment systems thinking cooperative, which is really a drive to improve the amount of data that's available so that we can have much greater resolution of understanding of what the problems are and, and how we can build, you know, then we can build consensus um, uh, in those in those partnerships. So hopefully we'll be successful in that. And it'll be really interesting to hear people's thoughts um about uh, uh about cabba so i'm going to ask each um speaker and i'm delighted that ali's um, uh, managed to join us probably hot foot from another meeting um uh so i'm going to ask um each speaker to introduce themselves in the order of um ali um and then peter and and jesse and if you could just um say introduce yourself and where and, and where you come from but also to um talk about your experience of cabba and, and your thoughts about its um uh its future that would be really helpful um, I'd ask you to avoid acronyms. We've had a few comments in the chat about acronyms, and so if we can all try and spell out all these um, uh, all these acronyms, that would be very helpful. And if I could ask the audience to put any questions in the in the Q and A and try and keep them focused on on the topic, um, and any chat in the chat. Um, so, uh, Ali, without further ado, I'll hand over to you, um, and I'd be really interested to hear your your reflections. Thank you, Mark, and good morning, everyone. I thought that in thinking about the catchment based approach and, and where it's come to, it would be really useful to start with where it came from. And as you mentioned, Mark, it, it had its roots in the Water Framework Directive, so the EU directive that gave us the structure of how we consider the health of our water environment and how we plan to improve it. And the catchment based approach was England's policy response to some of the requirements in the directive that talked about things like um, stakeholder involvement, talked about uh, local decision making, public participation. And at the time, it was a sort of unique way of, of dealing with those requirements. Um, but looking back now, it's, it's hard to think of a, a better way that we could have dealt with that. These catchment partnerships that have been established across England provide that basis for that local stakeholder engagement, that local decision making. So it's a really um, positive response to the requirements of the, the directive. And the idea that it's at a catchment scale, I think, is key to that because we understand the catchment as being the, the sort of natural geography at which we should consider the health of the water environment. So we saw catchment partnerships establishing across the country with the support of DEFRA and the Environment Agency. And it's that local collaboration that I think has been really positive in my experience of catchment partnerships. So when CABA first started out, I was based uh, within the Wildlife Trust and I was involved in helping to set up one of the catchment partnerships that we co-hosted along with our local Rivers Trust. Now, we hadn't worked very closely with that Rivers Trust previously, but it became a very positive relationship. And you could easily see that, you know, as water sort of rose up the agenda and we were both delivering on the ground, we could have very much come into conflict in terms of competing for funding, in terms of you know, airtime, in terms of volunteers that we needed, all sorts of things. And so the catchment partnership was a really useful um, initiative for sort of all of the partners on the ground working out where they best sat in terms of delivery, where they could bring their strengths, their capacity, their local contacts and so on. So it was really positive seeing that catch and partnership established from nothing and growing um, over time with the involvement of, of new stakeholders, new partners. And I think I've seen that mirrored at the national level as well. So uh, as well as being involved in, in catch and partnerships on the ground, I've been involved with the NSG from the beginning, the, the national support group that Mark mentioned earlier. And similarly, that was very well um, well populated by environmental NGOs towards the beginning, but we've seen it grow and expand over time with the uh, addition of you know, water sector stakeholders, um, the flooding sector, as these different partners recognise the, the benefits of working collaboratively and, and the strengths that the catchment based approach could bring. So from there, we've seen it grow further, the establishment of the working groups that are set up to support the different elements of CABA, drawing upon the expertise of the um the supporting organizations 
So that brings us to where we are now. And as you said, Mark, um, we've seen the catchment based approach referred to by the Secretary of State when she was launching her um, the, the government's plan for water um, earlier this month. And threaded throughout that really was a recognition of the importance of an integrated approach to water management, uh, working at a catchment scale, um, holistic approaches to you know, viewing the pressures that affect our water environment. So really that's talking about CABA, the catchment based approach, and it was threaded throughout the plan, which um, I think was really positive, uh, because what that represents to me is that this is a recognition that the catchment based approach is, is a key um, policy mechanism for achieving the improvements, improvements that we want to see in our water environment. And it's a plan that's not just developed by the DEFRA family, but it's been endorsed across government. So I think that's a really strong endorsement of CABA. You know, 10 years on from its beginnings and it really sets the stage for where we go from here in terms of the role that CABA has in helping to deliver government aspirations not just on the water environment but the wider environmental obligations that we're um, signed up to so I think CABA is in a very positive place. Thanks very much, Ali. Um, caught me on the hop there, I couldn't find my mute button. Um, uh, um, over to you, Peter. It'd be great to hear your thoughts. If you could just introduce yourself as well. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I've been involved with CABA really from the word go. I can remember discussing the initial concept with um, Chris Ryder and Bob Earl um, right back at the start of it. Um, and I'm chair of um, one of the, probably one of the, the, one of the oldest um, CABA working groups. We used to be called the Urban Working Group. We've rebranded ourselves the Urban Water Group because it makes more sense to the people we deal with. Um, and the Urban Water Group came about um, on the back of a project in Lewisham to um, uh, renaturalize the um, River Ravensbourne and the bits of the River Quaggy. And it was a very successful um, project. And at the end of it, um, those of us involved in it um, said to each other we, we really need to, to sort of roll this out on a wider basis um we need to promote urban catchment partnerships and partnership working with local authorities and we need to promote the value of local action and so that's how the urban water group came about and um i think we've been very successful since then i mean what we do we champion a, a collaborative sort of partnership approach to urban water management and we promote and support urban catchment partnerships, but we really focus on raising awareness of integrated water management and its benefits across a really wide range of stakeholders um, to drive improvements in water quality and biodiversity, to reduce flood risk, enhance health and well-being, and build community cohesion. Um, so really our focus is on local action uh, to deliver multiple benefits. And the membership of the Urban Water Group includes um, environmental NGOs, we've got the Rivers Trusts, Groundwork, Wildfowl, Wetland Trust, um, also um, uh, the um, sort of um, legislative, well, the, the uh, managers of, 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 of things, uh, the Environment Agency, Natural England. We also um, have a strong representation from local government and water companies, which are very important in delivering what we're trying to do. And the way we try and deliver this is two ways. Um, we hold workshops and webinars and we provide guidance. The workshops and webinars, um, before the pandemic, we, we've been running a series of workshops around the country, um, really focusing on bringing together the key players in, a, in the urban water management sector to explain really the benefits of um, an integrated and collaborative approach to urban water management and to showcase examples of um, successful things that people have done around the country. Um, after the pandemic, we changed our focus to webinars rather than workshops because people were less inclined to meet in workshops. So I think we need to look at that again now we're emerging from the pandemic. Um, and recent webinars we've done have ranged from um, things like preparing drainage and wastewater management plans that deliver multiple benefits, um, promoting health and well-being through integrated water management, um, and a re recent one on working with local authorities to, to help catchment partnerships engage with local authorities. And in terms of the guidance we've done, um, we started off um, 
we, we generally produce and support other other guidance um, championing championing um, the collaborative approach to urban water management. So first one we did was with Lewisham Council on the back of the Lady Oil Fields project, which was a guidance note for planners on development near water, particularly near rivers. Um, and then we contributed to two major pieces of guidance on um, delivering integrated water management. One was the Cambridge University one focused on um, the planning system. And the other was the um, recent, more recent Syria one, um, that's Construction Industry Research and Innovation As um, Association, um, on delivering better water management um, through the planning system as well. Um, and um, we've also supported um, the publication of various other um, guide pieces of guidance including seeking funding um, and recently we we did our own we did a, a substantial piece of guidance um, on delivering sustainable urban water management through local action which was published in 2020 um, and through this um, I think there's various challenges that um, we've identified and we've tried to find solutions to the major one is funding um, and we think the solution there is partnership working to share resources um, so that we achieve the outcomes that each partner wants. Um, multiple benefits, of course. And we call this delivering more for less. And that's been a very, very successful way of getting people to work together and use the, the funding that they've got more, more effectively. Um, the other big challenge is joining up, um, making connections between bodies and organisations that need to work together um, to deliver integrated water management and sort of realize those multiple benefits um, and it's getting out there and talking to people and demonstrating to them the benefits um, silo working has been another real challenge we've come up against uh, we need to break down the walls between different organizations and particularly the walls between different parts of the same organization we keep coming across this with local authorities you know the planning department doesn't talk to the transport department they don't talk to the parks department and they're all trying to do the same stuff and often we've had re really cases where the um uh um the sort of transport people the roads people have then have dug up the um suds which have been put in by the um water management people and uh, Oh, bang your head in the wall sometimes but breaking down those silos um and also overcoming institutional thinking i mean it's persuading organizations to think outside the box and look critically at um, their sort of traditional ways of managing water and look and see if there are better ways of doing it um so i think we've we're rising to those challenges but those i think are the main challenges that we've been facing in terms of actually delivering this on the ground Thanks very much, Peter. Just while you're live, a um, couple of questions have come in, one in the questions, one in the chat, about um, uh, the, the availability of those documents you mentioned. I presume they'll, they'll be available on the Catchment Based Approach website, is that yes, right? Yes, if you go if you go on the um, working groups part of the Catchment Based Approach website, there's links to all of those guidance documents. There's a page on them and they're all readily available through those links. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Peter. We'll come back to you in a minute. Jesse. Um, be interesting to hear your reflections. Thank you and nice to see you all today. Uh, my name is Jessie. In the past I hosted two CABA catchment partnerships, one for the Cam Ely Ooze area and the other for the Wensum area. I'm now project management office lead for the Rivers Trust and as part of that managing the National Catchment Systems Thinking Cooperative project that Mark mentioned earlier trying to integrate citizen science with water company and regulatory information. So just a few reflections from my end, Re reflections from hosting partnerships. It's really crucial to fund um, officers in the dedicated support roles full time to join up partnership working. And also they play a key part in finding more delivery funding as a return on public investment. Then for more opportunities to fund regional and national scale approaches, we really need strong and dedicated coordination to be able to deliver that. And then the third reflection was, it's important to find a variety of forums and engagement outreach opportunities. Different forums work for different people and partners, and we still haven't brought everyone we need to into the conversations at the local, across sectors and regional and national scale. So there's still a lot more people to bring in 
to this. Um, some reflections from joining a national CABA water governance group last year was that we are really missing opportunities at the moment at the current rate to realise the connected environmental outcomes that we want to see. So we need dedicated groups to tackle those issues, but also to listen to the outcomes coming up from the existing partnerships and group working. And then finally, I just wanted to reflect on the global experience. We are not the only people trying to do this. So the EU water co-governance project that took place over five years also found across a number of countries throughout Europe that um, the catchment officer, the, the role and support funding to partnerships, how, how critical that was for long term success. But also the US example of the Chesapeake monitoring cooperative has informed our national uh, catchment systems thinking cooperative project. We also took that project along with CABA to the New York Water Week and heard some really interesting reflections from people across the world on integrating uh, partnerships and, and data sets to be able to achieve environmental outcomes. So those are just three areas of reflections, but um, absolutely, while, while I've only been involved in, in CABA and the Rivers Trust for a few years now, it's, 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 it's pivotal. We make this work and finding all the sectors together in one forum and one group of forums is really, really important. Thanks very much indeed, Jesse. So, I mean, I think I think what we've heard is that, you know, CABA provides the potential for being a mechanism to bring together multiple sources of funding to deliver multiple benefits. And so effectively getting more for less, as, as, as Peter put it. I mean, we, we've really faced too many problems to solve them one at a time. And I think that's been one of our problems in the way that we've addressed things. And you can see that in the, the government's kind of knee jerk reaction to the, the the outrage about sewage is that it's it's just said right water companies you deal with that um, and actually you know as we've heard from Penny in the previous session you know sewage it's a sort of systemic failure um, of too much water um, uh, um, overloading um, uh, sewers obviously there are elements of you know lack of investment etc um, and lack of enforcement over many years so but but this is a systemic issue and so we need a kind of a, a systems approach to um to solving it and i mean i think we are seeing some really welcome signs with water companies getting on board with kappa we've seen you know a couple of companies actually kind of planning their winnet their next um water industry natural environment program investment over the next five years which is you know billions of pounds planning those investments in partnership with catchment partnerships and i mean that's a really welcome development that used to be done in a completely black box between water companies and the environment agency at Ofwat, and now it's being opened up to community involvement i think you know that that's very very welcome and we've seen also companies investing in growing the capacity of of, of catchment partnerships um so you know i think that's really important for making sure things are locally relevant I mean, linking back to the Elm question, I wonder if, you know, the panel, maybe particularly Ali, have got thoughts about, you know, how Elm might be applied. Elm is a sort of top down policy devised in DEFRA that's meant to cover the whole country. You know, could the catchment based approach be a mechanism maybe for making sure that those policies are really relevant and delivering for, for nature and water um, and uh, climate in in a local area by by you know using that that knowledge of of the catchment to to adapt how it's applied and i think the other question i'd like to sort of put to everyone is you know is there a scale above cabo is there a regional scale at which we need to kind of coalesce we've talked about this missing middle um which is which is a regional coming together of of um, decision makers and, and and funders and delivery organizations you know do we need to create another layer um, uh, above CABA to kind of bring people together at that regional scale so Ali perhaps could you could you talk about maybe the sort of how ELM might interact yeah I think the the ELM's challenge is a really pertinent one because we have a we will have a mechanism through ELMS which is um, voluntary but which is touted as a key um, route to delivering some of the improvements we want to see in the water environment, in particular the um, water, water targets that were set through the Environment Act. Um, one of them focuses on agricultural pollution and it's talking about a significant decrease in um, 
in phosphate, in uh, nitrate, in sediment uh, coming from agriculture specifically. And ELMS is one of the key ways that we could look to um, support the, the achievement of that target. Um, but it's really difficult to see how that's actually going to work on the ground in the sense that although it's a, a sort of blanket target, we probably need to tailor where um, where different measures are deployed uh, in order to try and achieve that overarching target. So being able to um, support that through catchment partnerships is, um, is I think, a really useful avenue going forward. Uh, and that could look like um, prioritising the capacity to deliver land advice to farmers in priority areas. It could also look like um, trying to uh, promote particular measures in particular areas of the country, um, whether it's uh, soil management or whether it's taking land out of production um, and uh, restoring semi-natural habitats. So I think um, using catchment plans is the opportunity to identify, you know, where are the most significant agricultural uh, water pollution pressures within your catchment? And is there something you can do to be supporting farmers in those areas? Um, could be a, a really useful way of uh, prioritising how catchment partnerships work around the farming sector. Um, can I chip in on the regional issue? Um, I strongly believe that we need to bring things together at a regional level and it needs to be part of CABA. It's not something beyond CABA. And I'm, I've been around long enough to remember regional planning authorities and the, the sort of regional arrangements that were in place before the coalition government came in. And I think we need to return to that and we need, we need to um, link more closely with the way the planning system operates because this link between um, catchment partnerships and local planning authorities and local plans is, is key. And we need to join up the different plans. We need to join up catchment management plans, um, river-based management plans and local plans. And that I think has to be done at a regional level. So we need to look for some mechanism of bringing in reg a regional linkage and coordination. It doesn't have to be too um, mechanistic and hierarchical, but it ne there needs to be a mechanism to get all these plans, people who are writing all these plans to talk to each other at a wider than local level, they need to be produced at the local level and local action is absolutely key in this, but they need to be coordinated at a regional level and we need to look look hard at how we can do that. I'm, I've got various ideas, but I'm not going to promote them now, we haven't got time, but um, other people have got ideas too, but we need to get that linkage at regional level between what happens in terms of plans and what uh, whether they're water plans, land use plans or whatever, um, and how that goes from local to regional, then back down again to local. Thank, thank you, Pete. Jesse, yeah, over to you. I'll give you the last word because somehow half an hour has gone flying by. <laughs> oh, well, I, I don't mean to take the last word, but I just wanted to really echo what, what's just been said and just add, add to that, that I think we can absolutely bring Cabot into the regional level. I'm a huge supporter of filling in the missing middle. I would go even further to say that we need to consider investment and governance within that. The missing middle cannot absolve responsibilities at, at the national level. It needs to provide a connection and tackle some of the issues and track the environmental outcomes. And, and we must find ways to in, invest more at scale in this, as well as join up all of the, the planning, which is really important. Well, brilliant. Thank you, panel. Sorry, there wasn't nearly enough time for us to, 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 to explore this fully. But I mean, I think there's pretty, pretty clear consensus from us that, that, you know, this is this is something that if it didn't exist, we'd have to invent it. And I think that it could be massively enhanced with, you know, some serious attempts to to integrate strategically um, uh, by DEFRA. So um, uh, we will keep making the case and uh, we will get our business case in and uh, and hopefully um, we'll we'll get some good news. What I do know is that the funding this year for, for CABA um, has been approved and it's going to come out much more quickly this year than it normally does as a result of our efforts. So at least it'll be sooner. Um, so thanks very much indeed, panel. Um, and um, uh, Rebecca, I'll look to you to um, uh, to hand on to the next session, perhaps. 
yes, or uh, maybe people will be relieved to know that it is time for a short break. So huge thank you to all our speakers who have gone so far and really kicked things off with very thought provoking start. Uh, so yeah, as I say, we're going to take a short break of 15 minutes. So please everyone do take the chance to grab some refreshments, maybe move about a bit, and we'll see you back at 11.45 uh, where Tessa is gonna be chairing our discussion about sewage pollution, the big one. We'll see you then. Okay, so it's 11.45. Hopefully people are feeling refreshed and ready to delve into probably the day's hot topic. Um, so I'm gonna bring up Tessa onto the virtual stage to introduce our panel on sewage pollution. Uh, safe to say there'll be a lot to cover here, so I won't take any further time from you. Um, welcome back everyone. Hope you had a, a good leg stretch and a quick drink and a toilet stop. Um, so um, for those of you that didn't see me earlier, um, I'm the new Director of Comms and Advocacy at the Rivers Trust. Um, and this session, is all about sewage. So sewage, the big topic of the moment. Um, I've got three panellists joining me. So Michelle Walker from the Rivers Trust, Charles Watson from River Action and Alistair Chisholm from SIWEM. Um, so we've all heard about sewage and we have heard much about the problems of sewage in our rivers. Um, it's extremely high profile at the moment. Public interest and outrage is high um, and it's largely focused on the issue of combined sewer overflows or storm overflows, which can legally discharge untreated water at times of high flow to avoid sewage backing up into our homes and businesses. There are a lot of campaigns that are focusing on the problems um, and everyone from activists, NGOs, comedians, politicians, everyone's trying to capitalise on the moment where um, our rivers are such a high profile and the sewage problem in particular. Um, as I mentioned earlier on, and welcome for those who went there. Um, earlier today, Labour have just tabled a motion um, in Parliament to accompany ship publishing their water sewage discharge bill, attempting to force government to really crack down on water companies um, and the discharges of sewage, and if they don't, to accuse them of voting for sewage in our rivers. Um, you know, it, it's, it's all happening. It's a big story. It's lots of conversation. Um, and the Rivers Trust has always been right at the centre of that sewage debate uh, with the development of our interactive sewage map. Um, Michelle, I'm sure we'll give a bit more detail on that, but this year we're working to expand it from covering England and Wales to include Scotland and all Ireland, as well as, as, well as near real-time live sewage alerts from the water companies. Um, as I say, Michelle's much more of an expert on that than I am, so I'll leave her to, to fill you in a bit more on that um, and we can delve into some more of the detail about what that tells you. Um, we're also working in catchment supporting communities who want to see their local rivers designated as inland bathing waters. Um, that's something, again, we can, we can pick up in a bit in this discussion. So for the rivers, we've called this session the sewage problem. And for the rivers, there are kind of two problems about sewage. One is obviously that there's too much sewage in our rivers, um, which we need to tackle. The other problem is that potentially the narrative around sewage shields and covers up and hides all the other problems that we have in our rivers. Um, as Mark mentioned in the earlier session, problem around combined sewer outflows, overflows is a systemic issue. It goes much further than just discharges into our, our rivers. There's too much water, there's underinvestment, there's poor regulation, but there's so much more happening on up in the catchments. Um, and the danger of the public narrative is that it could drive the wrong solutions. So our, our rivers face many, many other pressures um, from barriers to flow, to land runoff, to chemical pollution, invasive non-native species, floods and droughts. Um, and the risk is that they get slightly brushed under the carpet or that they're actually perverse and they're exacerbated by the knee-jerk reaction to the sewage problem. So I'd like to now sort of hand over to the three experts here um, and I'll let each of them introduce themselves and tell you a bit more about their involvement and interaction and what they see as the sewage problems. Um, if we kick off with Michelle and then probably move on to Charles and then Alistair, um, I will hand over 
um, initially to Michelle, and then after that, we'll have some time for debate amongst us, um, and then we'll have some questions from the floor. So as questions crop up to your mind throughout this process, um, please just put them in the Q&A. There should be a button sort of bottom left-ish of your screen. Um, just add your questions in there, and we'll pick them up later on in the session. So Michelle, let me hand over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Tessa. So yeah, I'm technical director at the Rivers Trust and um, a self-confessed map nerd. I've been at RT for 12 years now, and um, as well as being a, a map nerd, I'm a really keen outdoor swimmer. So, um, you know, my interest in the, the sewage problem has really sort of combined um, my work and my personal interests. And that led me back about four years ago to develop a map to show fellow swimmers where um, sewage was being discharged. And that's led on now to incorporating, um, you know, the annual returns on um, untreated sewage discharges. And as Tessa mentioned, we are now looking to expand that map with data from across the UK and Ireland um, and to incorporate the live spill data that's um, starting to come out from the water companies. And I think that's absolutely critical to solving this problem. That transparency has driven so much of what we've seen so far. Without the data, people weren't aware of um, the fact that it was even um, possible that water companies were discharging untreated sewage. We've seen this sort of the shock and the outrage from people. And I think we've got to keep um, driving that sort of transparency and improving the data that we get, um, not just on untreated sewage. I mean, untreated sewage is the canary in the coal mine here. It's showing that um, there's underinvestment and uh, mismanagement of the way that we're we're treating our sewage. We know that um, you know treated effluent is an even bigger problem potentially. So we've really got to keep the the pressure on for increased transparency. We want to see consistent live data, and we want to see live data on what's happening with treated sewage as well, so that um, we can continue to drive action and people are aware of the problem. But underpinning that we've got to have a stronger regulator. We've heard this echoed all the way through this session. You know, we've heard lots of, of promises from government about, um, you know, uh, uh, unlimited fines for water companies and, and these kind of sound bites, but that's no good if we don't have the political will to enforce it. It's no good having unlimited fines if you don't collect the data and evidence to get polluters um, to court in the first place. So that's about better monitoring, better data, but also political will to, to enforce the regulations. And we don't want to hear about cutting red tape. Cutting red tape means more of these problems that we see. And, you know, another thing we need is about being wedded to more than just economic growth. We need to grow all of the capital that we have in our society, in our natural environments. So some of the measures that we've heard about already, the sustainable urban drainage and nature-based solutions, they will not only tackle many of the issues that we're facing in terms of pollution and flooding, but they'll also provide amenity in our towns and cities and our countryside. And they'll get people out in nature and improve our um, health and well-being. So we can create value across the entire system. Thanks, Michelle. That's a great, great introduction and a great start to, to kick off the, the debate. Um, Charles, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Charles Watson. I am the founder and the chairman of River Action. So R River Action is an... Um, a, a, I mean, it was it's a, a recent, recent, relatively recent entrant into this 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 community, and we launched just over two years ago. And we are we are effectively a campaigning organisation. Um, um, our, our initial focus, uh, and I think something very significant is happening in this whole debate about rivers. I mean, the, our initial focus was very much about you know calling out the polluters, calling out the causes of what's happening to our um, rivers, calling out, and it's been mentioned both. Um, both by um, Tessa in your introduction and, and and very clearly by just by now by Michelle calling about the total utter failure 
of the regulation of our of our rivers and, and the, the collapse of enforcement. Um, um, but I, I, I very much sense that we, we're crossing a threshold because, I mean, we, we have today, I mean, coincidentally, we have today published um, a, 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 for us a very important document, which is a charter for rivers. It's a, it's a, it's a series of um, actions that, that have to happen. But, but with that, we, we also did a YouGov poll and the YouGov poll showed that 90% of the public are now demanding clean rivers and over 50% of the public now regard this as an electoral issue. So when they when they go to the, you know, when they cast their votes in, in a few days time at the local elections and at some stage in the next 18 months at the next general election, um, you know, clean rivers is now has, has now reached that sort of proportion. So so I think the this is you know in the in the cycle of of dealing with a problem, um the acknowledgement of the problem publicly and nationally as 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 we we've achieved something i think collectively the you know from the rivers trust to the, to all the other you know campaign groups across the, the country i mean something very significant we've arrived at a very significant uh, you know point in time which is you know the world is no longer in denial people are no longer disputing the fact that we've got a problem the fact is our rivers are in a, in a desperate state and we, we you know we you know we we the recent the recent um De defra disclosures showed that although you know it was it was a slightly less um you know le less a volume of sewage was discharged last year because we had a drought it is still utterly unacceptable um i think i think the the fact that our our water industry you know its financial state following um you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make any political points here, but the reality is the water industry, the, the bodies that are dis discharging all this filth into our rivers is it's just not fit for purpose financially. Um, it, it, you know, when it was privatized um, all those years ago, it was it was debt free. I mean, it is now it is now carrying over 60 billion of debts after basically over 70 billion pounds of, of, of its profits have been paid out in dividends to shareholders. Um, and so. I mean, this is a really challenging situation because, you know, the big question about how do we fix this, this, you know, not fit for purpose sewage system at a time when it's facing demographic growth. I mean, just take my local water company, Southern Water. I mean, they have seen in, in the last 15 years, they've seen 30 percent population growth across its area, but yet no you know, financial resources to to invest to service that. And then, and then there's another. I, be, I believe there's another session later on about you know the impact of climate and the more extreme weather events and the pressures that's put in the system un, 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 underneath. But the but the great thing now is I think people are, are no longer disputing that this is now a national scandal, a national problem. It's you know the population of this country is crying out for a solution. What we have to now to do, do is, is is really focus on what that solution is um, because the industry has sort of both hands tied behind its back and that there's no money left. And this is not you know I mean, ironically. Many of the people now running the water companies are not the people who are responsible for that. Um, um, you know, they're, they're, you know, I, I have actually spent time with 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 some of the you know the teams and CEOs of water companies, and, and there's on the whole there is a new generation of leadership there who are who are acutely aware of this problem, and I think genuinely want to solve it. But um, there has to be a, 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 we have, and this is why you know discussions like these are, I hopefully are going to be very very helpful. There has now to be. A moment where we try and achieve a consensus on how do we solve the problem, um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but I'm I'm hoping we're going to have a chance to talk about some of the solutions that possibly are available to to end this scourge of of, of nature we're facing. Thanks, Charles. Um, those um, stats from your YouGov poll are really really interesting, and that's very much the the message that we're getting in conversations that we've had with um, politicians is they're obviously doing their focus groups and they consider they have seen from their constituents and their focus groups that sewage is a massive issue and water quality is a massive issue and they see it as a swing a swing feature oh. in, in the next election. So that's really interesting to see your results as well tie into that. Um, Alistair, would you like to introduce yourselves and give some of your thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Tessa. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I'm Alistair Chisholm, Director of Policy at the Chelsea Institution of Water and Environmental Management, or CIWEN as we call ourselves. Um, just a, a few things to, to build really on, on what um, Michelle and, and Charles have said. Um, and, and maybe to start with, think, think back to 2019 um, and what the kind of policy discussions in the water space were all about then, um, including uh, some, some um, select committee inquiries into water governance and that kind of thing. And sewage was nowhere 
in that discussion at that point. It's absolutely mind blowing how much um, the the publication of event duration monitor data from these uh, storm overflows has just massively captured the public imagination. And as, as Charles said, busted us through that kind of denial phase that this is any kind of issue. And now we've got to really, really knuckle down and think seriously um, about what we can do about it, how quickly. Um, so at SIWEM last year, we published a, a report. We, as a membership organization, we have a lot of members who work for water companies. We have a lot of members who work for uh, the regulators. Um, who work in water quality, flood risk management, water resources, the whole shebang. Um, and so we very much look at this as a, as a catchment, part of a catchment issue, part of a, a water systems issue. And we did a, a piece of work looking at a systems approach to, to tackling storm overflows. And amongst uh, a strong emphasis on the water industry, kind of getting uh, up to the speed that it needs to get to, um, we advocated for a range of other wider issues that are very much kind of part of the root cause um, of, of this issue and, and including um, government finally implementing Schedule 3 of the Flood and Water Management Act to put sustainable drainage in new development. That's a tiny thing, really, but it should help to stop the, the problem getting worse. Um, pushing for wet wipes to really maybe at the third time of asking um, plastics in wet wipes actually be be banned. It's a no brainer. Um, but, you know, fingers crossed that might move forward. And also just getting government to think much more from a systems perspective and look at where we can join up funding streams, um, planning. So it is more effective in prioritizing what will be the most um, powerful interventions at any point in the catchment and it if you take one thing positive out of the the plan for water i think the emphasis on systems thinking in that although it wasn't the headline piece it, it was a really fundamental move forward i think for the way that government looks at some of these issues but the thing that is really bothering me at the moment is money and, and outside of um the issues of dividends and exec pay it's not something that uh the media um, campaign groups are particularly talking about that much. Um, indeed, you know, the, the, the Labour bill today um, is saying that it can fix the, the sewage challenge at no cost to the, the householder. Now, I would, we heard that there's no magic money tree, you know, trees are made on that one out. I want to know where this is coming from. Um, money is a fundamental part of, of enabling the, the solutions to this to happen. Um, and a fundamental component of that money pot is the Water Industry National Environment Programme. That was £4.8 billion pounds last uh, water, water industry financial settlement. Now, for some companies, it's bigger than is likely to be bigger than that. And the whole programme is likely to be four to five times the size. The bill impacts of that could be up to £300 pounds in certain parts of the country because the burden of storm overflows geographically varies quite considerably. But in the government's storm overflows discharge reduction plan, it suggested that the bill impact of the measures between 2025 and 2030 would only be £12. So there's something not quite adding up there. We need to look more closely at the money issues. Um, between a third and half of water customers are worried about their bills and affordability. And yet the government has ruled out a single social tariff that would help to provide a more equitable basis on which to make these investments and reduce the impacts on vulnerable customers. So we need mechanisms that would enable us to make the big investments that need to happen, but make that transition water environment a just one. Um, I think fundamentally, and, and picking up again, Charles, on what you said in terms of uh, where we need to go next and solutions, we need to really understand what is possible, how fast it is possible to go, also how we want to do it. I think that's a fundamental piece of the jigsaw. If we look at legally binding targets, 
um, then there is a risk of unforeseen consequences where we go too concrete heavy because those are the kind of mechanisms that give water companies the most regulatory certainty, the least regulatory risk. Whereas actually, if we're going to be spending tens and tens and tens of billions of pounds, if we can harness that to deliver uh, nature-based solutions as widely as possible to achieve the same outcomes, we'll deliver a lot more to, for society. We need to understand, dig into the detail of what's possible on that front. Um, I think fundamentally, once we get past this little phase of, of elections, we need to stop playing politics with sewage and really knuckle down and, and work out what, what the art of the possible is. Um, we need to really make sure that this isn't a, a campaign for maybe slightly privileged recreational groups who, who have the ability to go out and enjoy their local environments. Uh, and actually works for, for those people who struggle to do that. Um, it needs to work for everybody uh, and we need to make it a just transition and I'll stop there. That's fantastic, thanks Alistair. Well, so much to pick up there from, from what you've all said. I think, you know, there's there's some really strong things coming through on data and transparency, regulation, and also the financial aspects of, of everything. And also, you know, making sure that we get the right solutions from this fantastic opportunity of public awareness. Um, Michelle, I just wanted to pick up quickly on, on something you said on, on the data. Um, if you could, just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on maybe some of the challenges you've faced in terms of transparency when you've been producing the maps and maybe where you think the gaps are. Yeah, um, so, I mean, a lot of the progress that we've seen has been driven by um, action from Richard Bennion actually many years ago when he put in the requirement on water companies for EDM monitoring. And, you know, we've seen obviously an avalanche of data coming out of that, but there are so many kind of shortcomings with that data. We know that the, the placement of the monitors and the, um, the quality of the data coming out of them isn't that reliable. There's lots of gaps around, um, you know, which CSOs are monitored at the moment we have very little on emergency overflows. And, and you know, a lot of these um, facilities aren't even mapped and, and don't have permits. So there are lots of gaps in that data set. But actually what we need is something across the piece. We don't just want um, to focus on untreated sewage discharges because we know that water companies are playing tunes on the network and they may be moving the problem somewhere else where there isn't monitoring. So let's get better data across the piece, not just focus on one solution and um, one problem. You know, we welcome better, um, the plans for better real-time monitoring of water quality in rivers. We don't think the, the sort of way it's been written to the legislation is proportional at the moment. We think there's much better ways you can do that smartly with agile monitoring. And we really think citizens and um, volunteers and communities need to be part of this picture. You heard from um, Jesse earlier about the Casco project that we're working on, catchment systems thinking cooperative. The heart of that is about better data and evidence to underpin collaborative decision-making and putting communities right at the heart of that not just because citizen science is a cheap labour resource, but because it's about getting people out and connected to their river. And, you know, totally taking your point, Alistair, that this can't be a niche, um, you know, kind of concern for, for sort of wealthy middle class people who like to go swimming or paddling or whatever on the river. We want to broaden out the appeal and the connection with rivers. And, you know, use citizen science as a real driver here, not just to get better data and evidence, but to, you know, connect people back to their blue spaces and and get them out, you know, connecting and, and caring about what goes on in their river, because we can see the power of that. If we get enough people behind um, an issue, they really do make their concerns known as consumers, as customers, as voters. So I think that's really key. And we can broaden the opportunities for people and link it into things like building jobs and skills prospects, which will give something back to people as well. But we need to join all of this thinking up. And I think I really liked the reminder from Mark earlier about um, Ireland's quote about, we need to gang up on the problem, not each other. 
And I think, you know, there's been a lot of sort of fighting and, and tension and lots of, you know, everybody kind of throwing accusations around. I want to see us exactly what you were saying, Alistair. Let's look at, um, you know, what the, the sort of attachment solutions are here and really look at underpinning that with better data and evidence at attachment scale and look at what we can get if we, um, you know, can put nature-based solutions into the mix because we have very little evidence that can underpin those investments at the moment. And if we can fill that gap, I really think we can start to get much more for our money and we can pull up multiple funding streams together that can tackle flood risk, that can tackle biodiversity um, loss and can tackle water quality as well. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, Charles, I was just gonna, uh, so, gonna bring so, you in there, yeah, jump in. So Michelle, I couldn't. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. This 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 notion of ganging up on the problem, but the, but the one way we are going to gang up on the problem is by effective regulation, and the, the, this is the, the the huge missing piece of the the um, the equation. So in the plan for water, which the Secretary of State announced um, a, a few weeks ago, um, I mean, I think there were some very positive and welcome developments. So. For example, un, you know, uncapping penalties, um, very the you know very variable, variable penalty um, um, notices um, is 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 very you know that that is one one sure way. We, we, and, and basically, it's really it's really important people understand the difference between um, fines, which which are uh, exercised through the criminal justice system, and penalties, which are a bit like when you pay a speeding ticket, you know, when you you know when you you're, or you're you're caught parking on a double yellow line. Um, basically, to it to 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 impose a penalty. Um, is it doesn't require such a big um, level of proof, and it is a much quicker and easier way of doing it. So, so this, in theory, should you know, for where there are instances, and there clearly are, and you know, the excellent work done by groups like you know, Wind, Windrush Against Sewage have shown that that there are still water companies that are gaming the system and effectively acting illegally and break, breaking the law. Um, the, the, and, and, and the problem um, we, we have had is that the only way to go after them it, um, historically has been through the criminal justice process. And so the big 90 million fine that Southern Water paid with great you know fanfare last year related to something that happened you know 12 years ago i mean that's that gives you the idea of how cumbersome the the the, the deterrent deterrent was now so so by 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 shifting a much bigger deterrent into out of the criminal justice system in, into um, a, a penalty system that creates a deterrent the only snag is that who is going to enforce the deterrent? So, so I mean, when, if we if we cast our mind back 15 years ago, the, the EA was on average um, taking about over 200 um, prosecutions a year against polluters. Um, if we if we go back to the period over the last five years, that 200 a year has fallen to three a year. And that is basically the result of a defunded environment agency that is that has had its it's, a, it's over a ninety percent collapse in enforcement actions. It's had its um, enforcement budgets, its, its environmental budgets in real terms over the last um, twelve years cut by seventy over seventy percent. Um, and so the so the huge big missing thing from the Secretary of State's great plan for water was you know great let's have a much more effective penalty and 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 and, and deterrent regime but if you have not got the law enforcement capability to enforce it it is it is a, basically a, a joke and and that was n that was nowhere to be seen in the um, in 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 the plan for water is how is the EA going to be restored to a functioning um, properly funded body and it's like you know it's, a, it's the equivalent of announcing we're going to increase the speed limits on motorways you know to an ex you know but we're but we're but basically we're but we're going to abolish the traffic cops um, so it, it 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 is a crazy situation so I mean that is fundamental before we even you know nothing can happen until we have a regulator that is fit for purpose and is properly resourced and can do its do its job. Sorry, Alistair, you were going to add something to that. Yeah, I was just going to uh, add add a little bit more woe to to that one. Actually, um, you know, I think fantastic. Really, the, the agency maybe has uh, bigger teeth um, to to kind of bear at, at polluters, but the challenge with um, those penalties and the the ring fence fund that they would be, um, you know, financing. Is that ultimately, if you're going to get charged a penalty, or if you're going to get charged a penalty, that's for new, presumably for new damage, which is occurring, or new pollution that is occurring over and above what currently exists at the moment. And that then the recovery fund effectively is there to just repair that that damage. You know, we're 
the state of our rivers is is in such a um you know a poor state at the moment we've got a very low baseline if if the recovery fund and those penalties are, are really just to stop it almost getting any worse my again going back to my fears about money there's going to need to be a huge pot of investment to to just lift that that base level that poor base level higher um and and absolutely those kind of fines should be um much more proportionate to the the level of damage that is being done but i don't see how it's a mechanism to kind of deliver a net increase in in the health of rivers it's just going to kind of stop them getting even worse thanks um I think we're getting to the point where it would be good to look at some of the, the questions um, from some of our audience, um, unless there's any sort of last come back that to there to Alistair's comments. I don't know if Michelle or Charles, you wanted to come back again. Um, I did just want to add one more point that we haven't mentioned yet, Tessa, that's about, you know, it's not just about water companies tackling the sewage problem. You know, we've we know that septic tanks and misconnections are also a massive problem here. So just an appeal to kind of you know it's the not throwing the baby out with the bathwater we, we've got to keep sight on the whole problem and you know we're seeing massive problems around um parts of the country particularly windermere where we know that you know and, and the southwest where we know tourist numbers will increase massively across the season and the septic systems that those holiday homes have aren't built for the for the sort of changing numbers of people so we need government regulation not just of, of big industry but at a smaller scale as well and, and, I think, and just know, to add and sorry and just to add to alistair's point um about money um it is also all about money i mean the 1.2 billion that was you know uh, announced in the plan for water bringing forward um you know capex programs within the water companies that reduces cso's by three percent three percent i mean that is simply unacceptable so so i mean billions i mean tens of billions are needed and 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 the big debate as to who pays that does the customer pay that do the shareholders the water companies pay that um um or do the does the government pay that i mean at the moment nobody want uh, none of those people want to pay that and 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 that reality has to be faced faced up to as to who pays the bill to fix our broken system yeah thank you um We'll probably come back to money in a bit. I'm I'm going to have the first question as one that um, someone posed in an earlier session so that it doesn't get lost. <laughs> um, so Catherine Langwitton um, asks, and I think this is to Michelle really, should water company EDM data be the primary source of monitoring? Or could smart cameras which alert on spills and show impact in real time, could these be a more effective primary monitoring method? So, I mean, I think, you know, EDM monitoring, as I said earlier, it's definitely got gaps all over the place. And, you know, things like cameras and, and smart technology and sensors definitely have a role to play. We want to see monitoring of the, the sort of wider environment and of the wider sewage network as well. So things like flow to full treatment data, you know, the sort of data that Peter Hammond and Windbrush Against Sewage Pollution have analysed um, and you know been able to pick up through machine learning where spills are happening. Um, you know when the sewage works aren't at full capacity, so early and dry spills. I think all of that is fantastic. That should be the regulator doing that. You know it shouldn't be down to um, volunteers and citizen scientists to be taking the the lead on those kind of technological advances. And, you know, you look at um, what's off what the water industry have promised in their innovation strategy. It's about transparency and open data. Well, let's start seeing it. Let's start seeing um, measurement of impact as well, because that will underpin the, the investment that we need in this and make sure that we're investing in the right place, and not just having a knee jerk reaction. Um, you know, it is a very emotional issue. This people get very fired up as we've seen but you know people that we work with um you know I was having a conversation with the river restoration center they're going what about the the sort of habitat and and um impacts of you know all of the work that we've done to the physical modification of our rivers that's having just as big an impact so let's get data across the board that can tell us what the the biggest problems are and where we should start to fix them because often the solutions can fix multiple things at once. 
but we've got to have the evidence to underpin the investment. That WINET programme needs a certain amount of evidence to underpin it, and we need to, um, you know, change how we regulate that, how we um, incentivise and permit it as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, actually, isn't it? The um, I think the EA Environment Agency data um, recognition of of what causes failures to achieve good ecological ecological status actually has river modification as the highest highest reason. It's something that we rarely ever talk about. Um, Alistair or Charles, is there anything you wanted to add to Michelle's comments there? No. Not, um, not really. Yeah, there's a, there's a question here actually, which um, reminds me it's something that we haven't actually spoken about yet. So um, it's about putting the water industry back under public ownership. I think it's something that we've, <laughs> we've not picked up on. It's something that used to be a big issue. Mm. It was probably one of the issues in previous elections. I think only the Green Party are currently still suggesting it. Um, but yeah, and any comments on what you think about the case for putting water industry back under public ownership? Well, now we are talking politics, aren't we? Um, yeah, sorry. I mean, I mean, clearly, I mean, clearly, I mean, it should never have been allowed to get into such the state it got into. Um, you know, for an essential service such as water, you know, to have found itself in the hands of, you know, overseas, you know, um, high leveraged investment funds, you know, I mean, that 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 should never have happened. But but it's a very very difficult situation because I mean, there does you know, I mean, wave a magic wand. Yes, it should be, and you know, and and billions of pounds of public finances should be going in to sort the. The, the rivers problem, just like billions of pounds of public finances have, have been found for other emergencies, whether it's um, pandemic emergencies or supporting Ukraine emergencies or cost of living emergencies to subsidise fuel bills or whatever. But but I mean, the, but I think the problem, you know, I mean, the, the reality check is uh, there does not appear to be any political will amongst any of the major p political parties to do this. Um, and and obviously, without the political will, it's not going to happen. And um, and and so it is a big question. I mean, I think there are very interesting hybrids. So, for example, if if the government were to say to the water companies, we are going to take you know twenty percent of each each of your company um, in return for putting in an amount of money, and we the government will get back in return for that putting in the money needing to sort your system, we will get that twenty percent ownership. But if you want to put that in yourself and not have us take away twenty percent of your company, um, you know. Um, you, you by all means do that. Now, some of the water companies have balance sheets that could finance that. I mean, two or three of the water companies are almost insolvent. I mean, they are literally um, on junk bond rated. Um, in my previous life, I came from that sort of business world. I mean, you know, they are incapable of really doing anything. Um, and, and that is that is that that is unacceptable. But they're, they're, but but without the money, all these wonderful things, getting better monitoring, getting better regulation, getting better all the, you know, all of that is is critically important, but but this industry needs it has been starved of capital at a time when it's been put under huge additional pressures, as I was saying earlier, whether it's demographics or climate, or, or just trying to bring a Victorian or Edwardian sewer system up to up to modern you know modern standards. Um, um, it it does not have the, the financial capacity in its current structure. So somewhere additional money has to come into. Now, it's quite, it's quite interesting. I mean, you know, um, Southern Water was recently um, acquired by Macquarie Bank and Macquarie, um, Macquarie in their original um, uh, um, existence when they uh, originally owned Thames Water were one of the asset strippers. I mean, they've actually come back in as a capital investor and they're, they're not, they've st stated publicly, they're not expecting to take out any dividends, but they genuinely believe that if they can fix this, this company, it will become, you know, from a capital perspective, more valuable for them. So, you know, are there and are there different types of investors who, who would be prepared to invest in the industry on the basis that, you know, their shares might become more valuable? I, 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 I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's a hugely complex issue. The one th issue is that there has to be more money, and and if we if if our if our political parties don't want to do that, um, it's very difficult to see how this problem is going to within an acceptable time scale, um, this problem is going to be solved. Um, Thanks, Alistair. Yeah, jump in. Yeah, I, I'd agree. I think um, you know, given given where we are now, taking taking that into to public ownership feels like a, a massive step for, for any party um, because fundamentally that will put the bill straight onto um, the public and, and in a very political way. Uh, and of course, you know, you are then fighting against the other competing pressures with the NHS policing and, and so on and so forth. Um, whereas the thing with, with a privatised industry is 
at least government can um, point to water companies putting up the bills if that has to be a, a reality um, rather than um, you know the, the chancellor effectively or a secretary of state um, so I can't see from where we are now that it's going to fundamentally change I'm, I'm curious about what Labour are, are pushing um, because the, the whole concept that this is something that could be achieved at, at no cost to households um, I can only assume that's because they they foresee some mechanism of of paying for what needs to be done through automatic fines that they're they're talking about. And you know, as Charles said, some of these companies are pretty much in, insolvent than being able to take on absolute mountains of of financial penalty as a mechanism to um, you know pay for for the improvements that are needed. I just that that would pretty much finish them as far as I can see. So we're in a really really difficult bind and. Um, you know, I think at the point of privatisation, it was not a popular thing. It's similarly unpopular now, but we are where we are. Um, it, it's, uh, I think almost it's a distraction. Um, but that said, I think we need to uh, put an awful lot of pressure on these companies to um, put their communities first, uh, maybe look at how they're, they're constituted, um, change the balance between um, the the interest and, and the influence that, that shareholders have and their investors have over how much their local communities have um, and, and put the public interest much more to the fore in how they operate. And, and one way of doing that would be, for example, I mean, um, believe it or not, in the in the 21-22 financial year, I mean, over £20 million pounds of bonuses were paid to CEOs of water companies whose environmental performance has not improved. Um, and also, there are still large dividends being paid to shareholders. So, um, I mean, to, to, to relate things like, you know, incentives for, 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 for management and, and um, rewards to shareholders um, directly to material improvements of in environmental performance would seem an absolute no, no, no brainer. Um, and, and a better fine system, a penalty system with proper enforcement from the EA would definitely focus, focus people's minds more. Um, but there is still a gaping black hole. And it, it, it needs some very clever people <laughs> to, to really work out how there is a potential public, you know, public private partnership um, where, you know, outside, if it has to be outside investment can be bought in. But there has just been, it just seems that, you know, this problem, the whole issue of the environment, it's just been down the bottom of the list of priorities in government. Um, and it needs to be brought up the, the, the top of the list and real, um, you know, real attention um, pl pl placed on it. And, and, and Labour, you know, Labour clearly are not going to say anything before the election that will allow them to be accused of being, you know, I mean, they lost the last election on their spending commitments and they're, they're, they're having spoken to a number of, you know, senior Labour politicians over, over recent weeks. Um, they're certainly not going to lose the next one on, on similar things. So we are a bit in a, a state of limbo. Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks. I was just going to add in quickly that, you know, one of the things we haven't mentioned as well is about green finance and investment and some of the yeah. work that, you know, many of the people at the conference yeah. today are involved in the investment readiness fund projects where you're effectively directing, um, you know, green bonds, green investment into um, those kind of nature based solutions that has to be part of the mix. But I agree with Charles and Alistair that, you know, it's not a quick easy fix and you know if we if we re-nationalize the water industry you know where does the debt go well it gets added to you know exactly. already growing national debt so you know it's not a simple solution and it's not a, a quick fix and you know as and the saying goes well I wouldn't start from here if I was you but <laughs> yeah, yeah. we've got to we've got to put some imagination into this we've got to start looking outside the box and gang up on the problem you know let's We'll try and put our heads together for some creative solutions that bring multiple partners together. You know, that's part of the theme of, of this integrated conference. It can't just be environmentalists and it can't just be water industry and it can't be just regulators. It needs to be people who have the, the financial brains and understand, you know, what some of the sort of new models are that we could explore as well. Yeah, I think you're exactly right there, Michelle. And, you know, to leave this session, we're coming close to the end of it, but to leave it on a slightly more 
positive note, there are some great examples, as Michelle alluded to there, in, in some of the um, partnership working that we've been demonstrated. There's a, a very new, um, I think the first of its kind, um, approach that was applied in the wire catchment. And that's really focusing on who the beneficiaries of the improvements are, so that making, making schemes investable, um, so that there's a clear revenue stream, and the people who benefit from the improvements, who benefit from reduced flood, flood risk, from benefit from water quality improvements, the businesses and the, the industries um, will actually see a benefit from investing in, in systems so that they get eco, ecosystem services back um, to improve their situation. And, and that, that makes everything suddenly seem a bit more possible. Um, and, and maybe it's you know, at least one of the ways, the ways forward. Um, I think we're pretty much out of time, actually. I was just about to offer you the chance of if there's any very quick concluding comments just for the um, last 30 seconds. I don't know if anyone would like to, to finish up for us. Otherwise, I'll call in Rebecca. Refund the Environment Agency. Step one. Excellent. I'll second that. OK. <laughs> Brilliant. There we go. There you go. That's, you heard it here. <laughs> so I think that's it. This is um, possible. Yes. <laughs> So I'll hand back to you, Rebecca, and thanks very, very much, guys. That was a really interesting panel and um, look forward to following on discussions further. Thank you. Yes, thank you everyone and, and thanks to the audience as well. Uh, I think as expected, that was a really lively discussion and it's got a really good response in the chat and the questions. Um, and there's lots to think about, a lot to explore. We probably could have programmed a whole conference just about sewage pollution, um, but Alas, that's only one of many issues affecting rivers. Um, something a bit different for you now, um, talking about uh, things like political will um, and, and such like. We're gonna bring in Councillor Matthew Bird, who is from the Lewes and Eastbourne Council. Uh, he is just on his way in now. Um, so Matthew, if you are ready to come on camera. Um, Matthew's going to be talking about some work down in Sussex about campaigning for the rights of rivers, um, which is a little bit of a first of its kind, I believe, approach in the UK. But uh, over to you, Matthew. Thank you, Rebecca. And um, thank you very much for asking me uh, today. Um, I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen and share a little presentation. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm hoping you can see that okay. Uh, it does just need to go into full screen mode. Yeah, just trying that. Um, there we go. Is that okay? Uh, yes, yeah. Great, just thank a you. A couple of seconds, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> okay. So um, yes, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, I'm from uh, Lewis, which is on the um, southeast coast near Brighton. Uh, I, I am a councillor. I know we were talking about um, politics in the last session, but I think I'm pretty much the most unpolitical uh, politician there is. I am an outgoing councillor as well. Um, so I held, held the uh, sustainability portfolio at Lewis District Council. Um, I have quite broad background uh, in climate change and sustainability. So um, I was also an officer, sustainability officer at the council where um, I'm now a councillor. And um, I work for the Sussex Wildlife Trust as climate lead. So I've kind of come at this from uh, with quite a broad perspective. Um, I'm also a seasonal water swimmer. Um, so yeah, not when it's really cold, but just about. And um, so I want to talk to you about, I think it's really pertinent to the last session, which I listened to with interest, um, because it is a bit of a response to, I suppose, what I and others feel has become a very polarised and quite sort of almost quite narrow focused um, discourse. The two pictures that you see at the, uh, on this first slide uh, show the River Roos actually in Lewis Town. Um, and the first, the black and white one, was in taken in 1923, um, and the the other one was just taken uh, a couple of months ago, in fact. And you can see that, you know, the River Roos in um, certainly within Lewis Town was very industrial. Um, I don't know if you can just about see, but in the 1923 one, 
uh, there's like a little narrow channel to the to the right uh, in front of those gas cylinders and that was the original course of the river and so um, you know, there's been lots of cuts along the river ooze very industrial as I say in in the more recent picture you know quite recreational uh, to the left of that where uh, that that green space is um, people are walking there's a a, a nature reserve and um, so and and actually in that time I would say that even though the river moves straight through the town of Lewis it's it's actually been sort of quite ignored so I think things have been done to the river rather than for the river um, the river is um, it's uh, 35 miles long uh, from uh, Slapham in um, West Sussex to um, New Haven in East Sussex. It's really diverse, so it's quite it's it's quite agricultural um, in places, very rural in places. But it's also it's it's a working you know at its river's mouth, it's a working port where you can get a very good ferry to uh, Dieppe. So there's a lot going on, and um, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of tributaries. In fact. There's 750 miles of streams. Um, it's uh, we have notable species like sea trout and lamprey, um, and uh, one of the I think wonders that that put, I I think sort of actually sort of competes with the um, the the murmuration of starlings in in Brighton is the mullet murmuration sort of every March. So people uh, feel very connected to the river, um, and I think the river's been in the past. It's been heavily modernised. So certainly on the on the lower roofs there, sort of south of uh, Lewis, it's been straightened and canalised. Um, and as we covered in depth in the last session, um, a lot of pollution issues. Um, so see the big focus is on sewage, but a lot of nutrient uh, pollution, road runoff, um, roof runoff, all, all sorts of issues. And as I think you're going to be covering soon, um, and certainly something I'm very interested in is is around climate change. So, um, you know, in terms of uh, we have recently actually um, on one of the sp uh, spurs, uh, which you can just see uh, Glind Reach, hundreds of thousands of fish um, uh, died, and and that was basically um, uh, sort of deoxygenation hotter temperatures after a storm. So all sorts of severe weather events, lots of invasive species, lots of subsidence on the banks. So lots of climate pressures. Obviously development we've mentioned as well, um, huge house building targets um, and you know, on a, on a sewage system that just cannot cope. And, and I suppose more recently, and I think um, it, is, it is interesting that I think the the sort of the 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 sort of frustration at the actions of water companies and the engagement in in rivers has been really noticeable since lockdown uh, because I think during lockdown actually in in common with a, a lot of other uh, sort of bits of nature I think people sort of really really discovered uh, the river and the kind of more sort of tranquil side of the river I suppose um, and and a lot of people. Uh, got involved in swimming. Uh, we have a lot of swimming groups along along the ooze. So I, what I'm going to talk to you about really is, is around um, is, is rights of rivers and um, it comes uh, globally from uh, rights of nature. And, you know, there is there is this kind of I would say um, this 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 sort of big movement globally um, to look at how we might incorporate incorporate rights of nature into into um, constitutions and legal processes and you know as you may be aware um, rights of um, the corporations have rights and uh, you know so uh, aside from its actual board members and uh, you know and staff Tesco's for instance could could sue you um, so uh, you know that I've mentioned Tesco because <laughs> it's on on the banks of the River Ouse in Lewis, and uh, we have a lot of issues with litter. Um, so it it kind of seems only fair to me that um, you know the rivers and other parts of nature should at least have a level playing field. Um, 
and going on to you know to rights of rivers and sort of global uh, context i think the 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 wanganui river in in new zealand is probably the most um famous example um and you know so there are custodians there um the the maori tribe there have been legally designated as river stewards and i think there's a really I find it sort of, you know, a very sort of uh, impactful statement there, which says that the river is an indivisible and living whole and comprising the, the Wanganui River from the mountains to the sea and incorporating all its physical and metaphysical elements. And I think that's really important because, um, you know, as, as I think we found with the last session, it's really, you know, everything becomes focused uh you, you know on, on on sewage so even even with the pollution issue uh most people are just concerned with one aspect so and even with the sewage issue it might be livestock or it might be human um you know on on the river ooze there's um i think there's something like a, a thousand a hundred and twenty three sort of legally allowed um discharge points um, for southern water, but in actual fact, you know, there's there's 1,244 discharge points. So, um, you know, even within the pollution issue, uh, you can end up just sort of focusing on one thing, and then that's aside from all the uh, other issues and other pressures that that, that the river faces. So, I think um, you know, actually incorporate something that framework, an idea, a concept that incorporates. Uh, holistic approach is, is really important. There is a universal declaration uh, of rights of rivers, and um, that establishes uh, as, a, as a minimum fundamental rights, so the right to flow, uh, the right to perform essential functions within its ecosystem, the right to be free from pollution, uh, to be fed by sustainable aquifers, uh, to have native biodiversity, and the right to regeneration and restoration. So just um, yeah, just bear that in mind. Um, that that's the kind of framework. But we, you know, I suppose what we've been doing in Lewis is uh, thinking that that isn't fixed. Um, that actually it's down to uh, communities and those who represent the river, um, and that includes all the statutory organisations, whether it's catchment partnerships, environment agency, water companies, local authorities, et cetera, to um, debate what those rights would be. Um, so, yeah, th this is what I suppose I want to concentrate on. And, and this, is, um, this is how did we get here? Um, I suppose going back to that, idea that um, things seem to have become really polarized. Um, as a council, uh, we have already put um, uh, uh, two motions on water quality, uh, one on sort of, you know, general issue of this is outrageous, etc. Um, and another one specifically focused at um, development and uh, the inadequacy of the water in the the sewage infrastructure um to to actually deal with the amount of development that's sort of required and uh we we've had southern water to uh scrutiny panels as have other authorities uh you know there's there's been protests you know there's been lots of lots of yes quite political uh responses of outrage and um and I suppose uh, I and others have sort of felt that uh, it's just become the discourse become stuck and and heavily polarized and um, and that actually there were other areas there are other issues as, as has been mentioned as was mentioned in the previous session uh, there are other issues around the river that have just kind of been ignored um, in in this out in this in this righteous outrage uh, I, I feel. Um, so we actually, uh, I and a few others went to see a film at our, our very uh, at our local very sustainable cinema um, on called Invisible Hand, and and that film was about um, community in America, whose uh, a fracking company was moving in um, to the lake, and they asked those you know who are supposed to uh, safeguard the river, you know, and. Uh, 
and enforce environmental legislation and protections, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency to speak up for them. And they felt that they weren't being spoken up for. And in actual fact, that that they were that the EPA Environmental Protection Agency was siding with um, this fracking company, so uh, that they they uh, explored um, rights of rivers in that and and that you know that really sort of resonated with us and and you know I think as as has been stated on numerous occasions this isn't just a question of um, uh, the things that are being done to the river whether it is uh, sewage pollution, but it's also um, what's not being done for the river. So uh, yeah, there are, uh, there is environmental protections, but they're either inadequate or they're not being enforced properly um, for all sorts of reasons. So we had quite a conversation around, um, uh, around rights of rivers and actually it led to the formation of a, a group called Love Arus. Um, and the first thing we decided to do uh, quite ambitiously, I suppose, was to um, hold a river festival. And seven months later, we had this river festival. We had 1,600 people there. We worked very closely with uh, Ooze and Ada's Rivers Trust, with the Lewis District Council, um, with the Sus Sussex Wildlife Trust, the Railway Land Trust, lots of others. It was a partnership approach. And at that festival, uh, we had a Rights of Rivers uh, workshop. And people came up with a draft charter. And they also, uh, we also used um, something I wanted to use for a long time. We also had a big uh, community, you can see in the photo, um, an aerial map that snaked all the way across the room um, of the ooze. And we, we Love Our Ooze was set up to, um, to uh, both inform people, um, but also to celebrate the river and to capture data and information um, and to and to turn that data into action, so um, the river map has been part of that. And so, it's following on from the river festival, um, we decided to put a motion to council. I work very closely with the Environmental Law Foundation, and um, we uh, so the motion said those three things, and uh, and it was passed. And what was really interesting about it was it was. It started off uh, in the kind of usual way, being quite politically polarised. Uh, we're in Alliance Council with um, uh, uh, Greens and Lib Dems and Labour and Independents, um, and uh, Conservatives seem to be against it. But in actual fact, um, quite there was a very impassioned speech by one Conservative councillor, and they came on board. So, you know, to me, it just said uh, that uh, you can take the politics out of it if you try hard enough, he says uh, naively. Um, we've had a lot of interest in this. Um, we've got two years to work up a motion. We've had all the, all the broadsheets, newspapers, um, even had Al Jazeera um, a few weeks ago, did a really cool podcast with them. Policy Lab, who I know are working with DEFRA, uh, are really interested in this as a way of sort of, you know, as collaborative uh, decision making. And, um, you know, and, and, and this this is a movement. And because I think what it offers is it offers a positive approach. It offers a framework. It's not replacing environmental, uh, you know, uh, legislation. It's not, it, it's, you know, spoke to the catchment partnership in our area recently. Th this is something that, that everybody um, needs to play a part of. And, and I suppose, you know, what happens next, in some ways, uh, we don't really know. Um, we've got we've got two years to come up with a uh, charter for for um, the River Ouse, a deck, you know, a, a rights of rivers charter. Uh, as I said, we work with the Environmental Law Foundation very closely, and um, they're working nationally and globally on what it means locally. And I don't know how it might be implemented locally. The River Ruse actually crosses two local authority areas, but um, it might be that, um, uh, you know, the, we, because there's lots of landowners, obviously there's a question of landowners, um, but, you know, one of the things we've done recently is, uh, I mean, District Council owns some land, just, um, we've kind of worked quite a lot on some positive um, measures around natural flood management, nature-based solutions. We have this thing called Sussex Flow Initiative uh, and Wild Roos, we've, we've worked with um, partner organizations on. Um, 
and uh, we might maybe we bought some land recently um, to an account in in the town of Lewis um, on the banks of the the river, but between a, the river and a, and a council estate, and um, it, you know that we might be able to put a covenant on the on that land, for instance. Um, so you know, landowners are really really important. There might be um, potential around bylaws, but um, I know that Froome uh, attempted a motion looking at uh, using bylaws um, to implement rights of rivers, and that didn't work. And I kind of think people ignore bylaws uh, to a certain extent anyway. So I think there's all sorts of um, uh, areas to explore in terms of how it might be implemented locally. But I think um, I think you know one of the most important parts of this for me is is the engagement. And somebody's you know mentioned well we were talking earlier about the importance of data. Um, I mean one of the things we're we're doing is around citizen science water quality measure, um, testing. Um, so Ooze and Aid Rivers Trust do some testing. Uh, Environment Agency probably do a bit of testing. Um, and you know we're linking we're, we're taking a partnership approach um with uh, a few other organizations to see it using the community map mapping exercise where that water quality testing can be targeted whether it's nutrient uh, for some areas um it might even be detergents i know that there's a car washing operation which weirdly coincides with froth sometimes uh coming out of the nearest overflow so there's um there's 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 lots of opportunities around uh gathering data but it's really the engagement i mean uh, we we sort of found that with the sort of uh petitions the protests people get engaged they are righteously indignant outraged and then nothing happens and it's just the same old, same old. So, the, so this is really sort of trying to uh, sort of gather some momentum. And it's not, you know, and it's not just about pollution. It's about, it's about. Somebody said before, it, it's about sort of people taking um, sort of ownership of parts of their river and sort of, you know, and using that love um, and that sort of um, almost stewardship of the river to to turn it into practical action. And I think. Um, you know, one of the things that we're sort of trying, to, uh, we're, we're, we're sort of fathoming at the moment, and I think will become a big thing over the course of the next two years, is, is there a voice of the river? And um, what shape might that voice be? Could it be uh, one person that's uh, um, sort of appointed the guardian of the river? Or could it be a group? Um, because I really feel like, uh, you know, I'm in lots of, I mean, lots of committees and planning committees, et cetera. And um, sometimes that independent voice does not come through. You know, the river is always talked about in relationship to other things, you know, whether it is sewage, whether it is um, planning, wh whether it is uh, sort of environmental um, improvements. So I, I think having that independent voice, whatever um, shape, tone that takes is is really really important so yeah just finally um uh this is the website for for love our Ooze. um uh so yeah if you want to um find out any more information um then check that out so thank you very much Thanks, Matthew. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in, and, and I suspect there may be a few more on the way just to take us into the the lunch break. Um, but that was that was really fascinating. Um, and I think this is maybe the first time that we've discussed this sort of topic in a Rivers Trust conference, certainly in the, the few years that I've been here. Um, the, the first question on the Q&A is, is from Jeff, and I think you did start to unpack this a bit. Um, but Jeff said, what practical difference does giving the, the river these rights make, or is it just a feel good concept? Um, I wonder if I would maybe, if I may phrase that more as um, it, it has as, as big an effect on people's mindset as at least at this stage, this early stage of implementing it um, as a practical impact. Would, would you say that's fair? And could you maybe just um, elaborate a bit more on why that's maybe 
as important in some ways as those practical impacts? Uh, I will attempt to. Um, and there's nothing wrong with, um, with the feel good approaches. <laughs> um, I think we could all do with that. Um, and yes, I suppose in, in some ways, you know, as I said, I mean, I've, I've had uh, 20 years um, experience working in climate change, sustainability. In fact, when I started my job at Lewis District Council, it was right after um, the 2000 floods. Um, so, you know, and, and it had a, you know, massive impact um, locally. Um, and, and that wasn't just about, um, you know, kind of the, the, the practical aspects of the, the damage of the flood. That was, that was the, the loss of memories, you know, it was, a, you know, photographs and, all, and, and the way that, that people, uh, their, their identity, I suppose, um, and uh, their identity, the identity of the town was kind of um, somehow sort of harmed. And so I kind of feel like there is, it, it's quite weird because, uh, you know, I come from sort of quite a practical um, background, but it sort of really reminds me of uh, when sustainability was first being talked about, you know, after the Rear Earth Summit, and then local authorities were kind of tasked with implementing some parts of sustainability. And I remember all, all those other officers, uh, environmental health officers, and, um, and community just saying, what is this airy fairy nonsense? What a waste of time. Um, and then gradually, you know, it gains ground and people feel like uh, it, intrinsically there is something in this. Um, and, you know, look at where we are now with um, engagement in sustainability and climate change. So, you know, all I can say is that I, I think what, what this does is, I think it is really practical, in fact, because I think all engagement with people is, is, is practical. As I said, we have a tool with the um with the mapping the community mapping so we capture a lot of data i mean how practical is that uh, nobody's really doing that stuff um and we're sort of um you know we're looking at it in terms of sort of what it means um spiritually intrinsically what it means in terms of sort of pollution you know have people notice things on their daily dog walks you know is, is there something not quite right you know this is this is about um species that you know the right the right to flow for instance you know barriers in the river you know that they're that in fact in one of um uh the people involved in love arus you know had, had found this uh environment agency improvement site because there was some flood uh, there was some embankment works done and that's just been sitting there you know blocked up you know that that was sort of like lost in the river you know so there's all there's all sorts of things that aren't currently being um picked up by the uh by by the sort of current um enforcement legislation so i think what this is trying to do i suppose in some ways we are trying to disrupt a little bit because we and it is about a mindset change uh but it is still at the same time i i mean i would i would really um you know, argue the toss about the fact that it's very, it's very practical. You know, the, this is a way for yeah. people to practically get involved. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and leading on from that, um, we've got a question here from AJ that's that's had a lot of thumbs up. Um, so clearly, of interest to quite a few people. Um, I mean, first of all, AJ says absolutely fascinating and and really exciting. Um, but one worry that's uh, been highlighted by a researcher. Um, is that in some cases when rights have been granted to the environment in a, a similar way, uh, the, the engagement and the public support um, can dissipate a little bit because they maybe that people always see that job as being done. Um, so is that something you've thought about, AJ says? Um, and yeah, just leading on, I guess, to those next steps um, for that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think as I've been sort of... Um, quite open with is that you know we're not coming at this with a solution uh, there are many things to work through and and to fathom um and and i think um yeah I, I, I can see i can see that concern you know i mean i can see um i mean one of the first things in the debate that that we had um at council was um you know somebody who was kind of quite opposed to it at the beginning in fact one of only two people that stayed opposed to it uh, by the end uh said yeah but how can you do this? I mean, you know, what happens when the river is legally allowed to sue a, um, you know, an organisation? We were like, yeah, exactly, exactly, that's it. But you know, I so 
but I think at the same time, if we whether we get to that stage or not, the the river is is given a sort of right of personhood, which I you know I I, I think is 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 a big ask. Um, I think the thing that's really important is that um, it, it's 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 it is the engagement and it is the sort of representation and that this is getting people to think about it so in in terms of those um those rights there might there might be sort of you know i think this idea of covenants for instance i think the idea of a um different uh you know that because i think we have a huge issue with uh, riparian ownership uh, so along the river is you can't walk along the river is on the upper reaches because it's in private hands so you know how those landowners, the willingness of those landowners to implement any kinds of rights for rivers is, you know, it's gonna, it's a, it's a big ask. But I think that um, this is at least starting people to kind of think about those issues. And and I think so. I think the important thing is is that this potentially provides a framework for all sorts of different issues. And I suppose as as I keep coming back to it, it's it's everything's got very polarized and very sort of narrow focused recently. So I think, I think this provides quite a good uh, practical framework to approaching yeah. that. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, it is one o'clock and I'm, I'm loath to, to keep people from their lunch too much, but there's just one other question that I think is really interesting in the Q and A from Clementine, um, who said the writer and scientist Robin Wall Kimmerer talks about the grammar um, of referring to parts of nature as they and them, so this equation with personhood. Um, so she, they've just asked if you've seen a change in the language that people in the local area are maybe using to refer to the river, uh, which I think is just a nice question to to finish us off for this. It's, it's it's a brilliant question, and you know, and and obviously throughout the morning we've had this thing with acronyms and uh you know working in climate change the biodiversity world is really guilty of acronyms and uh and this language of jog and it yeah and it can it can act to um to uh, disengage people so i think i think it's really important I, I don't know if i've seen a change in language but i've certainly seen that that uh awareness sort of creep in the client we had um, a big debate on rights of rivers it was a uh, love Ari's put it on at the climate hub last week um and that came up um Quite a few times so it's it's a really really important point fascinating okay um unfortunately i'm not going to be able to come to the rest of the questions because i'm sure that everyone's maybe ready for a little bit of a lunch break but thanks so much matthew for joining us today that was that was really brilliant to hear about uh, and and best of luck with with all of the possible next steps for for protecting the river ooze um thank you very much so that Thanks. That does bring our morning session to a close. After lunch, we're going to be looking at nature-based solutions on a catchment scale.